this rally has been very fundamentally driven. It's been this easing inflation and interest rate shock uh, and less bad growth data. The economy is going to stay strong in the first half of this year, probably into Q3. You know, the consumer in the U.S. is still in a good place. More broadly, we haven't seen a recession. We see consumption still grow, growing very, very strongly, very robustly. I think we've skirted recession this winter. We will agree that Fed is going to continue to raise rates. That's not the issue. The issue is, how long will they stay up? This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. You want to do the football here or later? Oh, no, do it later. OK. Vinnie Modric and Benzema, that was just a clinic. That was beautiful. It was from, very good. From New York City, it's very emotional. There's, good morning, good morning. I, I had goosebumps I on a fifth goal. I teared up too. This is Bloomberg Surveillance so with Tom Keen. Now. Lisa Bramis and Jonathan Farrow. Futures right now on the S&P totally unchanged. The year was yesterday, closing at a new height for this hiking cycle to two year. We haven't seen it at this level going all the way back to 2007. <coughs> at the close yesterday, 472. We pulled back about three or four basis points this morning. But TK, Fed minutes a little bit later. Are these the most stale, dated yes, Fed minutes that we've seen so for quickly. a long, long time? Uh, absolutely. Th things are moving so, so quickly across equities, bonds, across currencies, even talking to Ed Morris yesterday. Well, I never heard Ed Morris as ambiguous as I heard him yesterday, the giant from Citigroup. But, John, things are moving and moving fast. To start with, Jeff Yu is just fabulous. The 30-year mortgage in America to your bond data check that you and I are going to do here, John, just in the short moment here, a mortgage 6.51% to 6.96%. Dare I say, let's round that up to 7%. Who's going to come out, sell their home, and take on that new mortgage if they're <clears> locked in at 3%? Two and a half, three, four percent, whatever that well, might be. It, it, the pandemic has completely destroyed the mortgage market. Yeah, so it, everyone's it, locked in on these very, very low fixed rates. They're not going to move. You saw it in housing yesterday, and I can't remember the year over year, but off the top of my head, it was 35% down from a year ago on the number of starts or whatever that we had yesterday. That's how it folds right. If all this fancy talk folds right into what people are living right now. We've got a big question. Does the February data confirm what we saw in January, the boom that we saw in payrolls in retail sales with a three handle? Does it? Well, we got a hint yesterday in the PMI. <coughs> the PMI coming in at an eight-month high, Lisa. I think that really shook things up a little bit more. The data has continued to come in hot, period, full stop. There has been no indication that the data in January was a one-off. It seems like not only has a warmer winter, but a reopening of China has changed the narrative. So what do you get if you have higher growth, faster growth, a better economy? That's terrible. But also, right, that's a good thing. But inflation, it's also hotter than expected. This is a conundrum wrapped in an enigma. Oh, the right, okay. Did, did you practice been, that this morning? No, I did not. <laughs> Just sort of, you know. I will say, though, that that's basically the conclusion from all of the notes that I've been reading. Barclays said it in the last week or so. The price for better growth is higher rates. Right. And that's ultimately the discussion, Tom, <laughs> going into the in, next in meeting. In umpteen years, I've never been in, like, a morning squawk box meeting or a research meeting or, you know, you go out with the big guy three levels up from you and you're at the steakhouse and you're like, don't have that third drink. And they're going, you know, this is a conundrum wrapped in, in an enigma. <laughs> That's it. It's never That's happened. Basically, where we're at. Conversation right now. over. Yeah. Equity futures look like this this morning. Good You're morning welcome. to you. Totally unchanged <laughs> on the S&P 500. In the bond market, lots to talk about. Your 10 year not doing much today, but look at that. We're getting so close to four. 394.87 87 on a 10 year. Tom mentioned crude. We've got to talk about it. I believe this is a six day losing streak on WTI. We're negative again by about 1% on WTI, Tom. 75, I, 60. I, on crude. I just don't want to overthink here. I, you know, I, I think as Lisa framed and it's so good to have Edward S. Hyman with us today with Evercore ISI because he's modeling out sub-3% inflation. There's a panic right now, John. Just, you know, you talk about the minutes being so stale. There's a real panic out there about OMG, good growth. We're getting an Elizabeth Warren economy. Good growth, jobs, fully employed. OMG, this is terrible. We're all going to die. I why don't is buy that, Why is that the Senator Warren Economy. Well, Bernie Sanders wants a four-day work week. Which, oh, you know, right. I'll take that, I, too. I brought it I'm up on board. Our, I, I, I brought, yeah, does my badge still work? Okay, I brought it up at our morning meeting, and I said, four day work uh, week. You know, Senator Sanders, book him right Lisa now. can do day five solo. How does that work for That's you, Lisa? Really, does that really? work? All I can say <laughs> is that the four-day work week has been put into an experimental phase in the UK, and most companies are not going back. Just saying. It's sort of uh, sticking around a little bit longer than expected. Here's what I'm watching, and actually more than the idea of stronger growth, which is a good thing, what I'm really watching is the geopolitics of it all. 8.45 a.m., President Biden is going to be meeting with the leaders of the Bucharest Nine, which is the entire uh, eastern flank of NATO, as well as NATO Secretary General uh, Jens Stoltenberg. At the same time, 
China's top diplomat, Wang Yi, is also meeting with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei, uh, Sergei Lavrov. To me, the juxtaposition here is really tangible. Are we seeing an ongoing hardening in the lines here, an ongoing uh, really ratcheting up of the tensions? And this, to me, is the biggest tail risk right now that I keep monitoring. At 2 p.m., we do get those Fed meeting minutes. You should read them, Tom, because, yes, they perhaps are stale, but, yes, they can massage them. Yeah. People were talking about how they're going to massage the meeting minutes to give a sort of sense of how they could take uh, Fed funds rates. If you take a look at the six-month T-bill yield, it is now at a new post-2007 high, fully above 5% and only climbing as people start to expect not only two but three more 25 basis point rate hikes before uh, June. To me, this is going to be really telling. At 5.30 p.m., New York Fed President John Williams is speaking in a fireside chat titled Taming Inflation. So here is the main issue, going to the Mohammed el Arian point, John, that you spoke about with him a couple days ago. How much is this Federal Reserve willing to allow inflation to run hotter for longer? If you take a look at inflation expectations baked into the market, it is well above 2%. It is near 2.5% over the next 10 years. Does the Fed allow that? Is that okay? Are they going to really just sort of encourage a sort of softer landing, even at the expense of a longer-term, higher inflationary uh, perspective? Hey, Lisa, thank you. Let's talk about how stale these Fed minutes are. So that Fed meeting was at the start of February. Since then... When Chairman Powell said the disinflationary process has started, we've had payrolls at 517,000, unemployment at 3.4 percent, big jump in the ISM services index for the month of January, CPI not dropping as quickly as people hoped for, PPI delivering an upside surprise, retail sales with a three handle, and then we got a first look at February with the PMI yesterday improving as well. Jeff, you joins us right now of BMY Mellon, and Jeff, I guess I'm going to lead with a question I've already answered. Just how stale are these minutes? Uh, they are quite stale, not just in a domestic sense, but in the international sense as well. Look at what's going on you know, globally. You know, services, PMI, quite strong in the UK, uh, in the Eurozone, windfall for Jeremy Hunt, the uh, Chancellor there. So are we going to look at fiscal stimulus in uh, Europe? And that's one trade side, which the US is exposed to more so than China. So now, not just domestic sides are strong for the US economy, you're looking at an external lift as well. Uh, so going back to a point made earlier, so higher rates, the price of good growth, why do have to be a price? Why isn't it something to celebrate? Jeff, you I look at this, and you're a student of history on this as well. OMG, rates higher, inflation, if not higher, at least inflation or disinflation sustained. And the, the basic simplistic thought is the world will come to an end as we know it. There will not be revenues. There will not be earnings. Life won't go on. And yet history says the complete opposite. How do we calm people down that life will go on? Uh, well, I think uh, they're going to need to look at the margins. They're going to have to look at earnings. Uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago, we were spooked by job losses in the tech sector. Um, let's talk about a margin recession, you know, a bit more so than the top line. But again, let's just look at what underlying demand is. Look at VAT receipts in the UK and Europe. They are rising. People are spending and on the continent, normally, where people are savers. They are starting to spend. They're seeing their energy bills starting to come down. They saved for very high energy bills, you know, oil above 100, but now it's not come to that. Uh, so maybe they can loosen their purse strings again. So let's uh, look at the earnings upside surprises. That will probably calm people down. Jeff, if you take the John Farrow view of the world and you create your year ahead outlook on March 31st, how would you reshape it right now based on what people were going into the year feeling that there could be some sort of softness in the first half, then a real strength in the back half? Now people have adjusted to real weakness in the first, uh, real uh, strength in the first half and weakness in the second half. Where do you land? Uh, so I would still land on no recession, and uh, we were skeptical that there was going to be a chance of a heavy recession uh, in the first place, and certainly at a higher level for longer, probably not in the camp of, oh, let's think about above 6% or something wild along those lines. Uh, is trend growth in the U.S. or globally uh, higher than where we were 15 to 20 years ago? Absolutely not. So, you know, gravity will come to play a role at some point. But we have to land in a place where it's higher real rates or longer and asset allocation will have to follow. What I'm following right now, also cash on the sidelines, money has to be put at work. Where is it going to go? I still don't think it's going to be in the dollar because most people own that already. Well, Jeff, let's put it all together. I said that Barclays had said that higher yields, higher rates are the price to pay for better growth. And you said, why is that a price? That's something we should celebrate. How do you celebrate it? 
Well, if you look at Europe, for example, if you look at a place like Switzerland, right, which has um, struggled with um, low rates um, for a long time, and we discussed this a couple of months ago, you know, suddenly the financial services industry there will be able to offer yields and to actually you know, keep money onshore as well. So this is going to change the flow dynamic, you know, whereby everyone blindly chasing yields, sometimes not of a dubious credit quality, I might add, you can now look uh, for the better gems out there, stay onshore in particular, these savings heavy economies, invest in domestic productivity because high yields means there are the higher returns domestically to generate that as well. So I would see this as a good thing. But as allocation, they need to just go with a new playbook. I'm a simple man. Does that mean by banks? Well, if we look at our, our iFlow custodian flows, financials, both in emerging markets and developed markets, financials, the most sold sector globally, full stop, right? And that's what's telling me is we have high front end yields, high funding costs, but there's no loan demand out there. That's the missing link, right? Um, going back to Tom likes to talk about the velocity of money that has not picked up because people are still scared. But if we see the consumer demand and further down the line, industrial demand out there, then banks can start to lend. There will be a margin. But that is where the opportunity is going to be, given the amount of selling we've seen. Hey, Jeff, this was fun. As always, it's good to catch up. Jeff, you there, a senior market strategist over at BMY Mellon. Bit of news for you. A little bit earlier this morning, we heard from China's top, top diplomat, Wang Yi, speaking to his Russian counterpart, describing relations with Russia solid as a rock and will stand the trials of the changing international situation. We've heard from the Russian leader just moments ago, Vladimir Putin, saying that Russia, Tom, and China and the relations between the two are reaching new milestones. So, someone to be familiar with is Wang Yi with his work at Georgetown uh, years ago. This is a guy fluent in obviously Chinese, in English, in Japanese. How many people can say that, John? It's true. Fluent in Japanese, <laughs> English, and Chinese. And this is the new face of China diplomacy, Wang Yi. And I think we'll be seeing more of him. China won't be pressured by a third party. China is willing to deepen ties with Russia. This coming at a time when the United States is increasingly worried about China providing direct support to Russia's war effort in Ukraine. This is incredibly complicated because it's also ahead of Xi Jinping making a trip over to visit Putin, Vladimir Putin of Russia. And the perspective of them orchestrating peace talks, is that really what's going on? Or is it more of what the U.S. is <coughs> alleging, a consideration of perhaps providing more assistance. We'll catch up with Anne-Marie next. Looking forward to that conversation from New York City this morning. Good morning to all futures doing nothing. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. White House aides say President Biden's trip to Poland underscored the massive miscalculations by Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. They say it also highlighted the costly investment in democracy that the U.S. and its allies have made. The president told a crowd of about 30,000 that Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. And as you've heard here on surveillance, China's top diplomat calls relations with Russia solid as a rock. The remarks by Wang Yi come as Beijing is trying to portray itself as a neutral actor that can broker peace in Ukraine. Wang was in Moscow to meet with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Meanwhile, The Wall Street Journal says China's President Xi Jinping is preparing to visit Moscow. We may get a sense of how many Fed policymakers saw the case for a larger interest rate hike increase at their last meeting. The central bank will publish minutes of that gathering at 2 p.m. New York time. They may also show whether Fed officials anticipated the need to take rates higher than previously thought to tame inflation. In the U.K., nurses have suspended further strikes. They say they've entered intensive talks with ministers in a move to resolve a dispute over pay hikes. Still, the government suggests it has limited ability to raise wages in the next fiscal year. And Microsoft has made it clear that there will be no $69 billion deal to buy Activision Blizzard unless it comes with the blockbuster game Call of Duty. Microsoft President Brad Smith spoke after a closed-door hearing in Brussels with EU regulators. Early this month, British regulators suggested Microsoft may need to divest Call of Duty to get the deal approved. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. President Putin's craven lust for land and power will fail. 
and the Ukrainian people's love for their country will prevail. Democracies of the world will stand guard over freedom today, tomorrow, and forever. <clears throat> so that's, what it's, that's what's at stake here, freedom. The President of the United States on his tour of Europe in the last 24 <clears throat> hours addressing the people of Poland and the people of the world for that matter as well on the relationship between the United States and Russia while there isn't much of one between Russia and China. Take a listen to this. This is from Wang Yi, China's top diplomat, describing ties between the two countries as solid as a rock and will stand the trials of the changing international situation. A headline from China's top diplomat in just the last couple of moments, Tom, saying that China is willing to deepen ties with Russia, and I think this is exactly what the United States is concerned about at the moment. Someone who knows more than we do, Ben Hodges, he is a general of the United States Army, retired with serious work on the Eastern Front. And John, I really don't know what wisdom to give you between Ben Hodges' tweet last night on the new Eastern Front or what we're hearing from uh, General Austin, uh, Secretary of Defense Austin, about the Philippines and the new Axis relationship between Russia and China. I don't know if I'm back in the 50s, the early 60s, the later 60s, somewhere in the 70s, I don't remember. It feels extreme to ask this question, Tom, but at the same time, I think we have to. How close are we to a proxy war? between the United States and China. I, 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 I'm not qualified to answer that other than to say I think it's overwrought at this time. I think common sense will prevail. That's usually what's happened, you know, after George Kennan and, and post-World War II. Uh, uh, diplomacy, common sense steps in. You'd hope so. We will have to see. We need a briefing right now. Amory Horton is our chief Washington correspondent with the president in Warsaw and joins us today. Amory, we could go on literally this morning for one hour. Let me start with a video from Moscow of Mr. Putin and Mr. Wang. How does the president of the United States adapt and adjust to the images from Moscow? Well, I already think you've seen the administration on the offensive already before these images were coming out. You had Secretary of State Antony Blinken over the weekend putting really China on guard for the potential, what they see, of Beijing supporting Russia in a deeper way. Their concerns are with sending lethal materials to Russia. But really what is going on is this um, quite historic split screen, what we are seeing between what's happening in Moscow, what's happening in Warsaw. Jonathan brought you those comments from Wang Yi talking about Beijing and Moscow's relations being solid as a rock. He was talking to Nikolai Patrushev, and then today he's sitting down with President Putin. At the same time, the president last night was talking about that the United States' commitment to NATO is, quote, rock solid and he is going to bring that message today to the Bucharest 9. So what you are seeing is just right. the deepening of ties. The last year, what was it? No limits relationship from Xi Jinping and Putin. And this year they're talking about the deepening of that relationship versus the deepening of the relationship the president wants to at least symbolize between the United States and Western Europe the, and Eastern Europe. And Marie, as you know, and you're a real student of this, I give you immense credit for that. The overreach, and I believe it was 2008 at the Belgrade meetings, Condoleezza Rice and Robert Gates, and the huge decision about how far do we reach. Does Mr. Putin look at the mm -hmm. Bucharest 9 as a threat and he doesn't have a common turn to push against it? Well, of course he does. I mean, he's been he's been saying this. The Bucharest Nine is made up of former Soviet Union states or those that were part of the now dissolved Warsaw Pact. These are this is Estonia. This is Hungary. This is obviously Poland. This is the same group of countries that met the day after Putin decided to invade Ukraine of February 24th. They met February 25th because obviously their concern was who will be next. This group was also started, of course, after Putin's aggression and his annexation of Crimea. So this group started in Romania. It was between the Romanian leadership and President Duda here in Poland because of Putin's aggressiveness to Ukraine and most notably that annexation of Crimea in 2014. As we see this split screen, as you described it so well, Anne-Marie, this idea of the meeting happening in Moscow and the meeting happening where you are in Warsaw, there's a question about the business ramifications. And there was news overnight about Chinese authorities encouraging its state-owned enterprises to avoid the big four auditing firms, to avoid possibly mm -hmm. leaking information. At what point do you see a willingness on the part of Western nations to sort of harden the business lines, aside from just the rhetoric uh, internationally, with respect to 
reacts to what those trade ties will look like between the Western world and China? Well, I think you're already seeing that happen when it comes to what the United States is doing. Obviously, there's these export controls on high sensitive technology, and not only was the U.S. enacting them from the Commerce Department, they're also getting on board Japan and the Netherlands. Um, what comes next remains to be seen, but I think it's quite obvious that there is a push in Washington to not just enact these rules against China, but also make sure they are doing it in this multilateral approach, which really is the difference between uh, the Trump administration and the Biden administration. They're taking the same exact approach on making sure that, because they have the similar concerns about China, but this administration really wants to make sure they're getting the likes of Amsterdam and Tokyo on board when they do this. And Ray, it's so hard to parse through the signal from the noise, especially when you talk about diplomatic rhetoric. How much have the lines really hardened between the West and China over the past couple of weeks? Well, I think what you see is the war of words and the acrimony because of the alleged Chinese spy balloon, right? That obviously put a huge spanner in the works because Secretary of State Antony Blinken was set to make this historic trip to Beijing, the likes of what we have not seen from the icy trip former Secretary of State Mike, Mike uh, Pompeo had made. Obviously, then at the Munich Security Conference, they were able to have this discussion, and there is going to be talks of Blinken going over to China. But um, obviously, this isn't just happening as symbolism in the world. Behind the scenes, these are serious concerns of the Biden administration and also the U.S. Congress. They just created a new committee to really look at the concerns and warnings on China. And this committee is going to be giving their opinions and what they think is the best practice approach to combat China. China. And you're likely going to see more of those bills comes to the floor. And it's just to finish, what's Chancellor Schultz in the last week? Good question. Yeah, Chancellor Schultz in the last week, well, obviously he was at the Munich Security Conference. He is not here in Warsaw, but he was at the Munich Security Conference. Um, and besides that, I'm not sure where he is today. I imagine he's uh, back in Berlin. But there's been a lot of questions regarding him, especially when you when you're here in Poland, you're talking to Polish officials. Uh, one, there's obviously concerns that they want those leopards ASAP delivered, and they also need the parts. Other countries that have these leopard tanks need the spare parts from Germany. You can only get them in Germany. So they're putting on pressure for the Germans to speed that up. And the second, of course, is uh, there's, I think, some a little bit of debate about Germany talking about the fact that they're no longer getting uh, Russian crude. It's coming from Kazakhstan. But when you talk to some people, there, there are these concerns that is it really Kazakh oil or is it potentially labeled Kazakh oil but actually Urals? These are some of the questions that are swirling around when you talk to uh, countries of the eastern flank. Amory, this was great, as always. AMH in Poland today. Amory, we'll catch up a little bit later. <clears throat> Elisa, how Germany chooses to balance some of these issues, tremendously complex. It was a great question that you asked because, honestly, they are, as you've pointed out many times, the weak link, right? We're talking about a nation that is highly dependent on China that really will see its economy go into a deep recession if it causes some sort of more substantial fissure between the two nations. I mean, and a lot of the optimism around European growth has been due to the China reopening this year. So how do you then deal with this? And that's the reason why I think this is a really interesting question, not only geopolitically, but also for markets. And also historically, your question was brilliant, John, and completely insensitive, as only John Farrell can do, because the historical baggage here is huge, the unspokenness. And Scholz was busy last week. He's not there. The president of the United States is there. But there are allusions here to the past that I'm not eloquent on. But there's allusions here that are delicate. Well, we have to frame the last couple of days as well. The president has flown into Europe, gone into Ukraine, into a war zone without an active American Our military train. presence, gone to Poland, addressed the whole world about ultimately <clears throat> defeating Russia's war effort. And what we've seen this morning is a diplomatic gut punch for the US administration, for the Chinese Communist Party and officials from Absolutely. that government turn around Absolutely. and say ties with Russia are rock solid. Yep. That's where we are. Futures right now, unchanged. This is Bloomberg. Yesterday, worst day of the year for US equity markets. Down 2% on down the S&P 500. Day? Down aggressively. You sent me that email when mm, you were watching yeah, yeah, Real that was Madrid. When I was going through the markets yesterday, watching a game, that was top of my mind, Tom. So, Where's the Dow year today? <laughs>
<laughs> the Dow. Yeah, right. Nasdaq, negative a tenth of 1% right now. Just a bit softer this morning. Three-day losing streak on the S&P 500. Longest of the month of February so far. Equities a bit softer in the face of this in the bond market. What happened to the breakdown of the correlation between equities and bonds? Yesterday, just equities down, bonds down. Yields up aggressively, like up 10 basis points plus across the whole curve. <clears throat> the two-year comes in a bit today by four basis points, 468, after delivering a close above 470 in yesterday's session. We're getting closer, Tom. I know you're on lookout for this. Close to four well, on a 10-year, 394 on a 10-year right now. Let's get out front of Edward S. Hyman this morning, joining us here with a call for real disinflation. And, John, I'm going to suggest we went from Stanley Fisher's ultra-accommodative to some form of accommodation down how many constant, maybe the first one to mention restrictive and super restrictive, were there. And now's when the heavy lifting starts. And that's what we're all living. And we're milking out some dollar strength as well. Take a look yeah. at this on euro yeah, dollar. Yeah. So euro dollar right now, 106.33. High of the year, 110.33. Do you know when it came? The day before payrolls. The day after the last Fed meeting. And then the data dropped and everything changed. Well, so when we go into Fed minutes a little <clears> bit later, what are these Fed minutes actually worth? at 2 p.m. Eastern time, given Why everything we've seen yeah. Look at her. between She's the Fed meetings right? in <laughs> and where we are. Well, you've promised about five times that you would read them, so now you're going to say you're oh, not, okay? Oh, okay, really? I'll, give it, I'll give it to Tom That's... Keen's skim. Well, the chairman said, the chairman was asked in the news conference if they discussed the pause, and he said, mm, uh, mm, mm, uh, and he yeah. did, what's your impression of Chairman Powell on that news conference? Something like that, right? It was good, it was poetry. And then he said, look to the Fed minutes. Yeah, something like that, okay. Okay, so he said, look to the Fed minutes for the discussion of the Fed pause. Now I think a lot of people are to go through the Fed, Fed minutes as part of a scenario analysis. What will uh, they do if this data picks up aggressively? And is there any insight whatsoever in those minutes that come out later? Although, to Tom's point, it's kind of ridiculous because I'd the reaction agreed. function changes every week, it seems like. So there is this question of, OK, we can game out what they're going to do, but ultimately they're going to do what they want to do. <clears throat> that said, they can give more of an impression from the minutes. So perhaps they can. You're suggesting they can massage things a bit. I am not the only one. They can emphasize certain points. They aren't okay. going to make things up wholesale, but they could potentially eliminate reference to those that are voting against. Have we done hikes. a data check yet? Have we done <laughs> that was a data it. Check? That was it. All three boards. Yeah. Okay, well, Bonds, 3.94 percent out to 3.96 in the 10-year yield. I'm sorry, 4.00 10-year yield's a big deal. That's a big change, Tom. Yet, no, we're getting closer. We're there on shorter maturities. It, it, it's the whole curve lifting. Does everybody understand this is not inversion dynamics, spread dynamics? It's this. On radio, this looks good. The whole curve shifted you know, hard by I 10 do, basis I, my points. My first exercise, I do. That was lovely. This, um, 35 pounds each. Are, are they lateral raises for the shoulders? I don't right? know what they are, yeah, but they nice. get the You've shoulders this. going. The girls, the girls like that. Good. Okay, let's do this. This we'll is important. <laughs> Where are we right <laughs> now? Where markets. we are is my theme for this year was the great zombie roll-up. Because profitability, if you're not profitable, you're going to get rolled up, and we'll see how that goes through the year. But the second idea, maybe I played it too little, is price down, yield up. Is anybody prepared for price to go through the October lows? To review the Bloomberg Total Return Index, this is the biggest, broadest of our uh, series on this. Down 18% was the carnage. And then the bounce was up 8% in price. And then we went down 4%. And if we go down another 4 or percentage, we break through to new price lows, new yield highs. A topic for Brian Weinstein, head of fixed income, Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Brian, what's the probability, the likelihood, the outcome if we breach through to low price, higher yields? Tom, I mean, I think no one was talking about it a, a couple of weeks ago, but it, it's certainly possible, right? December 20-something, we were about this yield level on 10-year notes, call it, call it about 3.9%. From that rate, you know for the year you're going to be between probably 330 and 450 or so. So that puts us, you know, through those old yield levels. I think a lot of people chased bonds a little bit too late in retrospect. It doesn't make them a bad buy, but it means that there could be more pain to come. Well, I, okay, the bonds are there, but then what is the to-do list here? Are you opportun? And I mean, literally on a Wednesday, are you opportunistic to acquire bonds, and in what way? Or are you just waiting to find that spot? I think you're waiting to find a spot. I mean, I guess that makes you opportunistic. But if you look, you guys were just speaking about it. The Fed doesn't even know. We don't know what to look for. I think a lot of the indicators that we've been waiting for are are, are either lagging or, or a bit stale. So I think uncertainty might start to re-steepen the yield curve. We've had an amazing bout of flattening. We touched minus 92 the morning of retail sales a couple weeks ago. I think we're around 75 negative right now. Um, so yeah, if you steepen the curve, higher forward rates, you start to buy. Um, but there's no reason to catch the falling knife. You 
you need to wait um, for a, a reason for us to stop selling off. And Brian, this whole curve's a mess. You can get a six month of 5%, a two year at 468, a seven year at north of 4%, a 10 year at 394, a 30 year at 396. Try and make sense of all of that. Here's the question for you, Brian, and I think it's a really important one. Are we facing a once in a generation opportunity to lock in high yields? Or are we facing a new generation of high yields? And there's a big difference there. Because if it is the former and not the latter, I'm going to take on a 10-year and lock it in for as long as I possibly can, maybe even go longer than that. If it's the latter, then I can take the six month at 5% and know there's no real reinvestment risk down the road because this is a new world. Which one is it? I think it's closer to a, a generational chance to buy. In other words, I, I don't think we're going to a, an environment we're going to be, let's say this is the new low, we're going to be between 4% and 6% on 10-year notes. I don't think that's the case. I think that there are natural reasons that growth here is slower, that the Fed will beat inflation. It will take a while, um, which the curve is telling you, but they'll, they'll beat it. So let's just say 10-year notes are in a longer term range of, I don't know, two and a half to four and a half or five. So I do think you want to buy. Um, listen, the front end is giving you a chance to park money, not worry too much, take some income for now. It's going to take money away from other markets, and that will that will continue to slow down the economy. I don't think we're setting a brand new regime, but I don't think we're going back to the regime where 10 notes can trade 50 basis points or 75 uh, for, for a long time. So, Brian, with that in mind, as you look across the curve right now, what's sort of the optimal spot for you? What are you advocating for to lock in those rates for longer? You know, I've been, as you guys know, in the big, big flatter camp. I think I said, you know, minus 80 to 100. And I think we pretty much got there at 92. So I think what you want to do now is start to put money to work out the yield curve uh, as, uh, I'm sorry, in the yield curve as, uh, as as time goes on here. So, you know, two is closer to 470, 475. Uh, maybe you get to five and, and then the five year note. I think the curve can start to disinvert either because we have economic strength and the forwards have to go up or because we are at the end of, we're getting a little bit of bad of strength here before the real weakness starts. Uh, and, and the Fed will actually have to to, to pause and, and even ease at some point in a year or so. How so I'm starting to move my buys in the yield curve for the first time in a, in a very long time. How do you parlay that duration call into credit at a time when people were talking about spreads being too tight? And then they widened by more than 100 basis points, if you look at uh, over in the high yield space, at least according to uh, some of the, the rating sectors. Do you see this as a buy opportunity now or do you see this as possibly pointing to more risk? If the curve is going to re-steep, and especially if the front end can rally, it's not a great time for it's not it's not the optimal time for credit. Right, we had the tightening since October. It was very meaningful. Um, at this point in the cycle, you buy quality and you come back to riskier things later on. So, how much are you looking at the potential for perhaps a six percent bogey, seven percent bogey on your annual returns based on this once in a generation lifetime, where you are going to see higher yields, but you can lock them in and ride the whole way down. Well, listen, Lisa, first we have to stabilize, right? So there, there's no reason if we go down, as Tom said, another 4%, that'll put us down pretty much 4% for the year. If, if we earn our coupon back, we'll end up flat. So you're not going to- There's a bond math. Spent. That's a famous <laughs> Morgan Stanley bond year. math right there. <laughs> <laughs> but if you but if you can find some of these values and you can be patient and you can get in at good levels, yeah, listen, hey, if you buy a six-month bill close to 5%, you're going to make, uh, I guess you have to do it twice, but you'll make 5% for the year. So you're not that far off. Yes, duration should help at some point. That point is not now. It takes a long time. The markets are impatient, but the Fed will uh, will tighten too much. They will start to ease, but we're just not. That's not the story yet. Brian, let's finish on credit and sit there for a couple more questions, if we can. I remember at the start of the year when high yield spreads were tightening up. They tightened to about 385. That was the tightest we've seen high yield spreads on a year so far. That was the morning, the same day that we got payrolls, the payrolls report for the month of January. And I was speaking to Gershon Distenfeld of Alliance Bernstein, and I said, this makes no sense. We've got sub-50 PMIs and spreads are tighter, not wider. And he said, Johnny can go one of two ways, not just one. He said, either spreads need to widen or the PMIs are going to improve. And the PMIs have improved. They've got better. We're no longer sub-50 on the S&P Global PMI on services. Now, Brian, I wonder, good news has seemed to be bad news for the equity market. What does it mean for credit? You know, I think if you take a longer term view, the credit markets are just ahead of the of the of the of the data, right? That's one of the problems the Fed has is that I keep pointing at data that is that are lagging indicators. I think the high yield market was a great indicator that things were going to bounce, that we had gotten too pessimistic. But the problem is on a longer term basis, the Fed has one mission, right? They want to raise cash rates high enough so that you buy a six month bill and not the high yield market. That is a tough headwind, right? It's not that they want unemployment. They, I mean, it will cause unemployment to go up. They don't want the economy to crash, but they need things to slow. So I think it is a tough headwind. Does that make good news, bad news? 
I think to some extent, yes, it means that the Fed is going to, it's going to be harder for them to stop raising rates if ISM bounces. And if the high yield market keeps widening, I think it tells you they're going to raise rates until it hurts. So Brian, is that still the game? Does it come down to that, what you just said, that this Fed wants people to buy the sixth month and avoid everything else? I, I think so. I mean, they've had every opportunity to do something different, right? You could re-steep in the yield curve. You could increase quantitative tightening by selling assets. If you wanted to change the math, you, the Fed could do it. You could point to a different indicator, but they haven't. They've been very simple in their, well, maybe they've been overly nuanced at times. But the, the idea is it takes a long time to stop inflation. It's psychological. The only way to do it is to make cash rates very attractive, invert the yield curve, and wait. Um, and so for all the noise since October, I'm not sure that a, a lot has really changed. Well, cash is attractive and the yield curve is inverted, that's for sure. Brian, we enjoy it, as always, to catch up with you, sir. That's Brian phenomenal. Weistin there of Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Bit of a clinic there, TK, on fixed income it, and some it, of the opportunities for everyone right now. Really, really important, John, and, and I can't say this enough, folks. Weinstein is hardcore. This is a Morgan Stanley tradition of looking at level, of looking at individual bond versus spread. Obviously, they look at spreads because that's the way Wall Street talks. But the answer is our listeners and viewers that own a bond – Maybe they look at yield when things are comfortable, but when things are a bit sweaty, all of this is Liz Goldenberg 102. They look at price, and the joke is price down, yield up. There's nobody worried about the three-month, 30-year spread here. They're looking at their portfolio at the end of the month and going, as Brian said there, wait, we go down 4%? That's a coupon for the year. Well, the price damage last year was yeah. brutal. Oh, Absolutely negative brutal. 18%. In, in credit, it was... I mean, it was great. You know, I mean, the triple leverage uh, all cash GPT fund, we were wide of that. How's that working out? It's working out great. The GPT function is really added. We added yeah. two basis points off that. The yeah, banks G the banks are banning it now. Yeah, I was going to say, so. JP Morgan doesn't like your fund that much. I think that they uh, are banning <laughs> yeah, GPT they didn't, and the use of they that. Didn't, Do not allocate to yeah. TK's fund. You didn't get it's a anti distribution anti agreement. <laughs> Futures we turning a bit a negative. Distribution <laughs> agreement with them. Dan, two tenths on the S&P. Can we get Brazil? They said no. Three-day losing streak on the S&P 500. Will we it add is. to that? This is Bloomberg. On the Dow as well. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Today's release of Federal Reserve Minutes are likely to show how much support there is for larger interest rate hikes. The question is whether more officials considered a 50 basis point hike at the last meeting. And the tone could hint at how policymakers are interpreting recent data on inflation. The European Union has slashed its natural gas demand this winter by almost a fifth. Now that beats a voluntary 15 percent goal that was aimed at helping it survive the winter with lower gas flows from Russia. Finland saw the biggest drop. Usage there was cut by more than half. Bloomberg's learned that J.P. Morgan Chase has curbed its staff's use of chat GPT. The chatbot has created buzz about its potential in everything from writing poems to creating stock portfolios. But there have been reports about inappropriate interactions and errors in its results. In China, authorities have urged state-owned companies to phase out using the four biggest international accounting firms. It's a sign they are still concerned about data security. The firms include PricewaterhouseCoopers, Ernst & Young, KPMG and Deloitte & Touche. High vehicle prices and pent-up demand prove profitable for Stellantis. The parent of Fiat, Chrysler and Peugeot unveiled a share buyback of as much as $1.6 billion after forecasting another year of double-digit returns. And they're offering some relief to car buyers too. Stellantis expects vehicle price increases to slow this year as chip shortages ease and production picks up. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. What about what happened in Europe? That's the big one for oil. Really big warm weather shop drove gas prices down sharply, particularly in, in Europe. We have TTF you know, dropping all the way down to 49 euros a megawatt hour right now. Uh, gas prices in the U.S. collapsed from nine all the way down to two. Um, so that lower gas price due to a warm winter put a lot of downward pressure on oil. Remember when we said we needed a meteorologist last year? Yeah, just to, just to forecast you? crude and gas 
and maybe even the equity market in Europe and the economic data as well. That was Jeff Curry there of Goldman Sachs. Crude right now. And let's take a look at oil together. <laughs> Oil's down for six straight sessions. That's the longest losing streak on WTI crude since December 2022. So it's the longest losing streak of the year so far. Crude right now, $75 and about 50 cents, Tom. Down on the session by about 1%. I have to say over the last six sessions, it's not a brutal brutal amount of losses. We're down over the last six sessions by about 6%, but certainly the losses are there for all to see. They're there to see, and we'll get to this with Aaron Rita Sam, but I think all you can do with, and everyone knows it's the single toughest thing to predict, I think there's a lot of good academics on that as well, is listen to smart people. And to go from Ed Morse of Citigroup yesterday to our conversation there with Dr. Curry at um, at, at of Goldman Sachs, and then Dan Marita Center. I mean, this is all you can do is talk to adults that actually know what they're talking about. To be clear here, Jeff was talking about the retreat we've seen in commodity prices, including natural gas, but ultimately he still sounds pretty bullish when you go through his recent comments, Tom, to Bloomberg TV, suggesting the China reopening, A-OK, we're on course. That's the core issue, isn't it? I Without mean, a doubt. I mean, uh, Christian Malik at J.P. Morgan, Lisa, I mean, it's a 100-page missile a year ago, and and there it is. They say it's about. And you had Jay Pulaski on, and you're, you're the hour you have the Pharaoh hour. You had Jay Pulaski <laughs> the on show. the Pharaoh show. Thank you. And it's a it's Pacific. You know, it's a Pacific Rim redo. The Malik Morse distinction, and I think that that's really the question. Well, How much you. do you start to that. see uh, the sort of renewables come in and reduce <clears throat> demand, even in an economic recovery? And that right. I think is sort of the distinction between the bulls and the bears right now. Let's drive it forward right now, and this is a joy. I'm to send all of these strategists folks take a different view on what I love about Amrita Sen off of maybe uh, Jeff Curry and his microeconomics at Chicago. She really looks at the dynamics of supply and demand, co-founder and head of research in energy aspects uh, in London. Amrita, just simple as I can, and I don't need a central theorem uh, lesson, but what's the correlation of your world right now to the stock and bond upset we're living? How does crude correlate? Great question, Tom. And as always, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. Um, I mean, look, I think part of the problem is crude oil specific fundamentals are not particularly strong. We've built a ton of inventories. We've had the bad weather. Uh, we've obviously had, or we do have right now a lot of refinery maintenance. And that's why right now crude is pretty much at the mercy of exactly like you're saying, the bonds and the equity markets. And this is why the six sessions we've seen that's been trending lower. And this is something we call for uh, just recently as well, that crude is probably going to be at the mercy off macro headlines. And by the way, now, even good news is bad news. You would think, oh, strong labor market in the U.S. is actually really bullish for gasoline demand. But guess what? No, now the fears are that means the Fed's going to raise interest rates. What does it mean for the future of the uh, U.S. economy? So it is very, very problematic for crude until fundamentals pick up. Well, when the fundamentals pick up, we do have China reopening. What is your x-axis on the China reopening? Are you waiting for May or are you waiting for May of 2024? No, I'd say May of this year. We've got a million barrels per day baked into our numbers of Chinese demand growth. I think the problem, of course, is that China, again, just coming out of the Lunar New Year holidays, that it, it too has maintenance. Look, we are hearing right now of potentially very low Chinese product exports coming out in March. We need to confirm that it's still a very early stages. Will be the very first sign that, yes, domestic demand is, is strong. Um, it will take a little bit of time for this to percolate through. I would say right now the oil price is actually focusing and factoring in a Western recession, and it really hasn't factored in the China reopening. Well, how much does this really factor in the fact that any kind of China increase in usage will be funneled into some of the renewables, into a lot of domestic production, whether it's wind or solar, this is what we were talking about with Ed Morse, that that kind of substitution, for whatever reason, is diminishing the demand even in a stronger economic profile? Absolutely the case in the longer term, right? But right now, you know, we've got more than a billion people um, who've been locked up for three years, and we are already seeing it in the jet fuel numbers. Just China's reopening alone can lead to 400,000 barrels per day of additional jet fuel demand. There is no renewables to replace that, right? So there is an enormous amount of pent-up demand. We've seen this in the West, and I don't want to complicate the story. The renewable story is absolutely there for the long term. EV sales in China are skyrocketing. We have that in the numbers. 
numbers. But that doesn't take away from the fact that gasoline and jet, which is basically used for mobility, we are already seeing very, very strong demand. People are going to fly, and you are going to see some very strong demand numbers out of the region. So good news, bad news, it doesn't really matter what it is, but the macro has been uh, oil prices lower. That seems to be sort of the trend regardless. What's going to shift that and get prices above $100 a barrel like you expect? <laughs> I think it ha we, A, we have to wait uh, really towards kind of second quarter, end of second quarter and into the second half of the year. Um, and for me, the fundamentals really have to tighten up. The stocks we've built will need to be drawn down, which we are expecting counter seasonally from the second quarter of this year, not before that. I think right now, and we've got a big gathering in London next week, all the traders and you know producers and consumers oh. are coming in for IE week. Um, I think you're going to get a lot of kind of talk around this as well. So I, I'd yeah. say after that, like you were really into Q2. Amrita, we really, the three of us, really look forward to seeing you there on an so, all-hydrocarbon week for Bloomberg. Oh, nice. Surveillance is, is, is well. Is that on the list, is it? It is. Obviously. Done. Yeah. Okay. Deal. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it is. Do you know you can't get a drink at the oil week in London unless it has an umbrella in it? Is this the same as... Copper you know, Week or whatever it's called. It's like Copper Week, yeah. Mm. But they're spread out. LME Week. LME Can I get to this quote from Morgan Stanley Please. this morning? So they cut their forecasts for crude for 4Q and 2024 to about $95 a barrel from 110. And this was the quote, Amrita, from them. The new estimates reflect stronger demand, but also higher Russian supply. Now, there might be some people mm -hmm. who aren't in this commodity market who would turn around and say, well, Russian supply, why has that affected the market? What is that all about? Look, we've also raised our Russia supply numbers because Russia is being able to place more barrels than we had initially expected. Again, par for kind of doing forecasts in an extremely uncertain world, that's absolutely fine. However, I go back to Chinese demand growing by a million barrels per day and SPR. We do not have a million barrels per day of SPR hitting the market. That's a two million barrels per day swing. So even if we assume Russian production is flat year on year, i.e. we don't lose any Russian production, we will lose some, but just assume we don't, it is still a much tighter market just from China and SPR alone. So that's the crude call. I just got a message from a Bloomberg subscriber and it just says, forget WTI, Natty, just wow. Yeah. Can we talk about natural gas just briefly, Amrit? Yeah. So what's behind that move? Weather. I mean, like you said, you needed a meteorologist in terms of... We, we need weather forecasters, but look, Europe got very lucky, and of course in the US as well, just how warm it's been, Jan, Feb, and even our March forecasts <coughs> have again raised just the amount of natural gas we are backing out as a result. We think natural gas prices will have to fall to about a dollar seventy-five before you wow. actually kick in shut-ins wow. in the US, so still a little bit more to go. Uh, but yeah, it has just been brutally warm. What a change, eh? Natural gas falling below two yeah. for the first time since 2020, and Amrita's looking for a further move lower. Amrita, this was great. Thank you, Amrita. Yeah, send there of energy great. aspects. Thank you. On the weather, do you want the weather? Mm -hmm. Okay. Across the contiguous 48 states, January was the sixth warmest on record. The six New England states, as well as New Jersey, were warmer than ever recorded, according to the U.S. National Centers for Environmental Information. New York, Pennsylvania, Indiana had their second warmest January in data, yeah. going back to 18. 95. And somebody was on and said you could go out I-80 to Wyoming with no snow, which I can't uh, imagine. There was a genius at A.G. Edwards years ago. He was going to play for the Cardinals. His name was Al Goldman, who came on every day and, and, and gave strategic wisdom and was very gracious. And once he said to me, Tom, the correlation of hydrocarbons is 74% with what the weather is at the subway stop of so, the New York Stock Exchange. So here's, here's 74%. The, I've heard that Somebody, before. Some graduate student <laughs> done some research on this. Okay, not to go back to this, but this is the sort of conundrum wrapped in an enigma part. Here so here's the thing where you get low natural gas prices, lower utility bills that gives people more discretionary spending to go out and shop, right? So you have this sort of distortion of weather that affects everything and at what point does it reverse or, or at what point can you kind of count on it as being real versus weather-induced distortions? Is it not real? Well, <laughs> I guess that's not the right way of phrasing, but, you know, not sustainable. I think okay. that's probably the better way of saying it. We'll see. Always, I'm always happy to trade a cold winter for a great summer. What do we get in the summer now? <clears throat> Just incredible heat and humidity. I'll take that. Really? I'm, I'm fine with the humidity in New York. Really? Yeah, I'm all right. I grew up with rain every day. We had one week of summer. Look at you. Like you'd get a week You're in like July Tom or August. with cold weather. This is you I'll, with, no, with I'll humidity. Take I'll take the heat. It's ridiculous. Some hot weather, Tom. That's nice in the summer. That's what summer's about. Oh my.
this rally has been very fundamentally driven. It's been this easing inflation and interest rate shock uh, and less bad growth data. The economy is going to stay strong in the first half of this year, probably into Q3. You know, the consumer in the U.S. is still in a good place. More broadly, we haven't seen a recession. We see consumption still grow, growing very, very strongly, very robustly. I think we've skirted recession this winter. We will agree that Fed is going to continue to raise rates. That's not the issue. The issue is how long will they stay up? This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Coming off the back of the worst day of the year for U.S. equity markets, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Equity futures right now unchanged on the S&P. We closed at a new high for the year on a two-year yield in yesterday's session and the highest level Tom, going all the way back to 2007, we closed through 470. Four-day work week, or maybe we're off the radar here, the minutes today and all that. I get, John, but I'm going to suggest there's a lot going on here. And it's a yield curve lift, and it's a signal here of a change that I would suggest very few people modeled in. This off was, the back of better data, Tom. unexpected. To As you mentioned, least. TK, the whole yield curve shifted higher yeah. by 10 basis points plus a whole yeah. the, across the whole of the curve. The question we've been asking over the last couple of weeks, looking at the January boom data, is whether February confirms that. We've got a sneak peek a little bit earlier yesterday, at least in the US PMIs from S&P Global. Now, I don't think it's conclusive, but certainly it was heading in the direction that it might confirm what we saw in January. Not conclusive, but strongly <laughs> suggestive of incredible strength, particularly in services. And this, to me, was interesting. It climbed above the recessionary, the contractionary level of 50 for the first time going back nine months. Suddenly, we're in expansionary territory again for services. And there was a spending survey for consumers that came out this morning that I thought was really interesting. Basically, people are taking money out of some of their basic goods items and putting it directly into flying around and staying in hotels. I mean, that's basically what you see, and it's confirmed in every yeah, data that you, you let's get. Let's stop. This is really important. I dealt with this this weekend, and I think the two of you have dealt with it more than me. Work from home has changed all these service sector things we talk about. Because people are traveling because they're not modeling out. We got to get out of here Friday at 4 p.m. <laughs> or 5 p.m., dash to where they're going. And Sunday at 12 noon, they got to come back. John, they're taking off Friday and Monday. I know. I mean, that's this is N more going Lisa on. Lisa was talking about the four day work week for some yeah. people. Is it three? <laughs> I don't know. I think it is for me this week. I think I'm taking off You're Friday. You're taking a three day, three -day work week. Three day work week. Did you see that UK is going to keep a, a four day work week? in place. They did an experiment and all the companies are like, ah, we're good. We're going to keep it this way. That works. Productivity's up, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, it makes sense. Are we we can't do it, though, because markets <laughs> are open five days a week. We should lobby the exchanges to, to bring that in we're four days. Exchanges. And we'll, it will work. More people we'll, will come we'll to work. We'll be on Zoom in our pajamas. Like, today's our, you know, Is this part of the lobbying home. effort? It begins right now. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Let's whip through the price action for you on the S&P 500. Totally unchanged. Coming off the back of the worst day of the year on the S&P. Losses of more than 2% pretty much across the board. Three-day losing streak on the S&P 500. Still up on the year, year to date on the S&P and the NASDAQ. But the moves we've seen in the bond market have been absolutely phenomenal. Tom, higher by more than 10 basis points in yesterday's session, coming in a little bit right now at 394. Well, coming in at 394, but we got the 396 here, and we adjust. I had the banner on the mortgage market, John, um, uh, in the last hour, and I'm sorry, the mortgage rate is buttressed, bank rate 30-year mortgage, John, is buttressed up against 7% again. Tell me a 7% housing market doesn't change the equation. Who's going to buy a house with that kind of mortgage rate, Tom? Who can afford to? Who's How much leave? value is taken out? You look, forget about three percent. How much value is taken out in any kind of urban area from four percent out to seven percent? Do you lose 125 buyable power yeah. or 175 buyable? I saw power? some of the latest housing data, Lisa, housing sales, and it said housing sales stifled by higher interest rates. And I thought, I'm not sure that's the right way of framing it. I think the right way of framing it is by saying this whole housing market is stifled by pandemic interest rates. Nobody wants to move. That's a good way of framing it. Basically, if you've got a locked in mortgage of 3%, why transfer that into a 7% mortgage, even if you can get a lower price? And this is the reason why perhaps you're getting stasis in the housing market, albeit not necessarily the declines in the actual prices that a lot of people were expecting. Here's what we're watching today. 8.45 a.m., President Biden is meeting with the leaders of the Bucharest Nine, as well as NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. We are just opposing it with the meeting that already happened with Wang Yi of China, the top diplomat there, meeting in Russia with 
with uh, the counterpart to Vladimir Putin, uh, with uh, Sergei Lavrov. How much do we get this sense that there is this ongoing Cold War that is deepening, or can we get some sort of softening? And it really matters from a market perspective because we're going to get a business case for this. At some point, businesses are going to think twice about extending their relationship across borders in this connection. 2 p.m., we get Fed meeting minutes. I care. Perhaps Tom's not going to read it or do the Tom Keen skim, but a lot of people are going to dig into how they emphasize the reaction function, how they emphasize the potential for ongoing rate hikes, albeit even at 25 basis point increments. And at 5.30 p.m., we'll get more color perhaps on that. New York Fed President John Williams is speaking in a fireside chat titled Taming Inflation. And I, honestly, I'm curious about what they say about the importance of getting back down to 2 percent in terms of a longer term inflation goal. John, this matters in terms of understanding how far they will raise rates and how long they will hold it if people believe that this momentum could last if you get a no landing type of scenario. Let's talk about that no landing right now. And Lisa, thank you for that. Bramo with the day ahead there. No landing. So this is January 9th, 2023. There will be no landing for the economy <clears throat> this year. That was Ed Yardani at the start of the year. Ed Yardani, president of Yardani Research, joins us right now. Ed, you, Neil Dutta, and much later on, Torsten Slock of Apollo, all talking about the same thing now. Ed, why did you see that coming earlier this year? And are you seeing more and more confirmation of that view? Well, I, I, I guess uh, my contrary instincts came out at the, at the beginning of the year. Everybody was talking about a recession. Uh, some people said it's 100 percent inevitable. Uh, and they had some data supporting them, the uh, Le Index of Leading Economic Indicators, which has an awfully good track record of forecasting recessions, has been screaming uh, a recession since uh, it peaked in February of last year. And typically it um, gives you a, a one-year lead time. So we should be in a recession right now, and it's just not happening. Uh, but I also uh, looked at the consumer, and the consumer data just continue to show that you don't want to bet against American consumers when they're... Uh, well, let's put it this way. When they're uh, happy, they spend money. When they're depressed, they, sp they spend even more money. And it's still a term quite loosely defined, so maybe we can tighten that up just a little bit now. Yeah. For, for a lot of people, it just means that the economy doesn't come down. We keep churning out great GDP prints, great payroll stories, yeah. all the above. But also that inflation <laughs> remains sticky. Now, is that the element you also forecast for this year? Well, I, I think that uh, you know, prior to uh, the release of the January's batch of no landing indicators in early February, I think we were mostly debating, all of us were mostly debating whether it was going to be a soft landing or a hard landing. Uh, nobody really spent much time talking about no landing. No landing, in my mind, means that the economy is growing two, two, two and a half percent, maybe more uh, this, this year. The soft landing, I think, is more like zero 0.5 to, to 1 percent. The hard landing is a traditional recession with negative numbers of 1, 2, 3, 4 percent. And I think that's what's changed. And uh, that kind of, as you said, that gives you, uh, promotes the no landing scenario to something that we need to debate. And there's mm -hmm. actually two versions of that. There's the inflationary one, which I think is what the market suddenly started to right. worry about. And then there's the disinflationary one, which I think is seems like a stretch, but I think it's possible. Oh, we're going to have Ed Hyman on. Yeah, I'll tell you, folks, we have Ed Yardeni and Ed Hyman on with Bloomberg Surveillance is what we're all about. Dr. Yardeni, I want to yeah. go to what all your no landing means for nominal GDP and the animal spirit of corporate America. Whether you get your two scenarios, you get an OK to, dare I say, right. a robust nominal GDP. What does that do to corporate America? Well, corporate America continues to have very good revenues growth. Um, it's uh, well, when I say that it means that uh, it's it, it's it's positive growth, and part of that is inflation, but part of that, as we see, is uh, real economic activity is doing uh, better than widely anticipated. Uh, so I think that uh, this kind of um, gives some credibility to the uh, more bullish, more upbeat outlook for earnings uh, that I've been uh, talking about, which is. $225 a share for earnings this year for the S&P 500 and $250 a share next next year. And those uh, numbers are uh, on the spectrum of uh, earnings outlooks is uh, among the more uh, optimistic ones. There are plenty of people talking about even now 200 or less uh, for earnings. 
Well, people are looking at margins, right? So revenue growth can yes. be really robust. But what we saw yesterday from Walmart and Home Depot was margin erosion as they're facing yeah. higher uh, costs for their workers. And they're also not able to pass those along. Is that going to be sector specific, consumer based specific, or is that going to be broad based margin pressure that you think just is already priced in? Yeah, it's interesting that you asked that because uh, just uh, for uh, t today, as uh, for, for our research, we're uh, working on uh, today on a story on profit margins, and we looked at all the data uh, using uh, forward profit margins based on analyst consensus expectations for revenues and earnings. And what we're seeing is it's pretty widespread. Um, everybody has some amount of labor that uh, they need to uh, operate. And uh, as a result of that, I think there there has been a squeeze, but I think some of it is pandemic related. I think uh, we're kind of getting back to a more normal labor market, believe it or not. I, I think uh, labor is going to find that uh, there is a limit to uh, the extent to which wages uh, are going to be raised by companies. And I think that's because the companies are starting to run into resistance from consumers uh, to, uh, to price increases. So that's why I'm a disinflationist. And I think that inflation can come down even if the economy doesn't land. Interesting. Ed, thank you, sir. Ed Yardani of Yardani Research. Ed, credit where it's due. Great call at the start of the year. Tough call on the equity market, but great call at the start of the year on this economy for 2023. And we'll see. Look, I think it's too, too early to draw conclusions off the January data. We'll look for the incoming data and inc incoming information for the month of February. We've had one read on that, Tom, and the PMI slightly confirming what we saw in January in that boom. Are we in a news vacuum on economics? I mean, essentially, is all this upset day to day because we're all addicted to, you know, CPI Tuesday and or payrolls or Friday, conundrum and enigma Wednesday, might I point out? Home purchase application Wednesday. That works. Yeah. <laughs> Does it, though? Yeah, they Not dropped really. to a 28-year low. This just came out. This is a huge deal. Yeah, just to give you a sense. I mean, we were just talking about seven percent. Yep. We're at six point nine six. I, I don't know how they. I don't know how you do it. I wonder if we start to see. And someone messaged me about this moments ago. In the UK, you can port your mortgage to another property. I, I wonder, Lisa, if the banks are going to oh, be under pressure to, so, to do a lot more of this. That's actually what's what people are talking about. That's the next step. If they want the fees, exactly. You know, yeah, just let people move with the existing transfer. mortgage at, totally. Can I ask a question? Sure. Can I get in an Alfa Romeo? Could, would you fit? Small? Would I fit in? You could get a big alpha. You could get a big alpha. Do you want to talk about alpha. that next? Yeah. Okay. An electric alpha. Yeah. I like alpha. <laughs> Beautiful car. Italian. <laughs> Futures up a tenth. Like a Lancia. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. White House aides say President Biden's trip to Poland underscored the massive miscalculations by, Vlad by Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. They say it also highlighted the costly investment in democracy that the U.S. and its allies have made. The president told a crowd of about 30,000 that Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. China's top diplomat calls relations with Russia solid as a rock. The remarks by Wang Yi come as Beijing is trying to portray itself as a neutral actor that can broker peace in Ukraine. Wang met with Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal says China's president, Xi Jinping, is preparing to visit the Russian capital. We may get a sense of how many Fed policymakers saw the case for a larger interest rate increase at their last meeting. The central bank will publish minutes of that gathering at 2 p.m. New York time. They may also show whether Fed officials anticipated the need to take rates higher than previously thought to tame inflation. The Biden administration will cut mortgage insurance costs for some first-time home buyers. The program will be unveiled today, and borrowers with mortgages insured by the Federal Housing Administration will see their fees cut by about $800 a year, or three-tenths of a percentage point. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. U.S. consumers are not really being hurt by high rates. In other countries, as rates go up, that hurts the consumer straight away. What we're seeing coming through on the data here, it's not happening here, particularly when you have such a strong labor market. It was Lee Ferrage of State Street. He was phenomenal. He was brilliant. Yeah. 
Ultimately, the point from Lee is pretty clear that he believes in long and variable lags, Lee, so they're just super long, yeah. like decade <laughs> yeah. long and variable lags. And that's just going to keep kind of pressuring things. Because forward. of the nature of the mortgage market. We saw a big move in rates yesterday. Twos out to 30s, yields up across the curve by more than 10 basis points. We're retracing just a little bit of that. Yields just a touch lower in the bond market, on the session at least, and backing away from year-to-date highs across the whole of the curve. If you look at the equity market, equity futures shaping up as follows on the S&P 500 positive a tenth of one percent yields coming in a couple of basis points tk 10 year 392 92 it's going to be interesting to see john this is an important interview that we're going to do right now i want everybody particularly in america to stop how about an automaker with a double digit return stellantis is the pieces picked up from the car i always wanted as a kid a citron peugeot and the rest of it up 21 percent per year from 2014, John Renault negative 3%, Volkswagen up 3%, and the U.S. manufacturers not much uh, difference. It has been an extraordinary path as they've picked up the pieces. I want to be clear here. You wanted a Renault when you were a kid. A Citroen. I just a thought Citroen. the Citroen was okay. a, you know, some. My movie. mom had a Renault 5, and my dad sold yeah. it, and she was distraught. Well, this is what we're going to do. That went down so badly in my house <laughs> back in the day. Yeah. For Americans, this is important because Alancia now is our new renaissance at Stellantis. And the leadership there is Carlos Tavares. And as John Farrow grew up rooting for AC Milan and owning a Lancia. A Lancia this Delta. Is, uh, a Lancia Proper Delta. Car. This is the design and character that makes the Pulse goes. Carlos Tavares joins us now, Chief Executive Officer at Stellantis. And thank you so much to inviting us at Behren for the Formula One. We really, really <laughs> appreciate joking. it. I got to drive the forward conversation off of earnings and the good news of your company today, which is you're looking for a warm spot in 2026. You had a joint agreement with the Swiss. They're moving on to Audi, fine. And the great mystery in Formula One is what Carlos Tavares is going to do to get into the new age of Formula One. Can you advance that story this morning, sir? What have you learned in the last couple of weeks, what your Alfa Romeo team will do? Well, first of all, uh, I would like to remind you that we have 14 brands. Of course, uh, Alfa Romeo is very warm to our hearts. Fantastic uh, brand equity, fantastic history. Uh, as you know, our motorsports uh, programs are focused on the 24 hours of Le Mans right now with the hybrid technology and the Peugeot brand and uh, also on the single seater electric races with the DS Automobile and Maserati. Maserati mm -hmm. is now a contender of the world uh, EV uh, single seaters. Uh, and that's where we are putting the focus. Off Romeo will come later. Off Romeo will have... Uh, certainly a motorsports program at one point in time and we still have time to discuss this as, as we are still in formula one for right. for some time and uh, and then we will unveil the program How? for our formula but it's too soon to unveil that and I apologize for that okay well we can do it later in the interview carlos help us here with how you bring the romance in your success of the, since 2014, how do you bring that over to EV? How do you bring Alfa Romeo and all you've done there over to electric vehicles? Well, that's very simple. Uh, actually, um, you just have to drive the cars. Uh, if you drive the cars, if you experience the takeoff acceleration of an EV, if you experience the smooth ride and uh, the improvement on, uh, on the noise and vibration, if you experience the very low height of the center of gravity, to put it simply, an EV car is a better car. It also because it's a better car, uh, you can easily bring it to Alfa Romeo with extended technology to uh, ensure that the customer drive is even more exciting and pleasant. This is exactly what we are doing, is extended sportiness, for the Alfa Romeo brand with better acceleration, uh, with better drive, with a, a smoother ride. And by the way, this is exactly what we do uh, with e-muscle American cars with Dodge. We bring more muscle, we right. bring more uh, burnouts and more donuts uh, with the it, electric technology. What, what, it's just a better car. Right, Lisa, what's so good about this is you can drive down Central Park West in second gear in an EV Alpha, and the noise you can make with that 
it'll be just killer. <laughs> yeah. Well, just killer. I, I'm, I'm not an expert in uh, the fake noises that you can create in your silent uh, EVs, but I do want to talk about the Ram and Dodge brands because we're talking about the U.S. And we're talking a lot just generally about margin pressure, and yet you recorded some of your biggest margins ever uh, with the sale of these types of vehicles in the U.S., and I'm wondering how long that can last, given that there's starting to be some pricing pressure on the margins. You are right to ask uh, that question. In fact, first of all, we should uh, just recognize that the employees of Stellantis, uh, starting in North America, have done a stellar job in 2022, facing all the external headwinds that they had to face. Now, to your question, uh, in the near future, it's going to be uh, an exciting period where everybody is going to try to hold on to a significant pricing power, despite the rebalancing between supply and demand, which is, of course, ongoing and uh, already there. So that rebalancing on supply and demand will put pressure on the pricing. But on the other side, because of the interest rates, we see some cooling in the economy that will bring more cost reduction on some of the raw materials eventually starting with, uh, with steel, which means from one side, pricing power is going to be under pressure, but you have the technology, you have the appeal of the products, you have the new models that are coming in. And from the other side, you need to run fast in reducing the cost at a faster pace than the erosion of pricing power. That's going to be the name of the game for the next year. And uh, we are in the race. We are in that race. And I think that uh, we'll see within one year, who is going to be the winner of that race. But uh, that's exactly how things unfold in front of us for the next uh, quarters. Uh, Carlos, does that mean job cuts? At this stage, uh, the the picture is about uh, how do you absorb uh, the uh, cost of electrification? You see, uh, you can see in many places of the world that uh, the customer has not yet totally recognized that EVs are a better car. And we see that when there are subsidies, to erase the cost of electrification, then the customers buy EVs. As soon as you remove the subsidies, and you have this example in Germany, you have this example in Italy, then the consumers stop buying EVs because they are not affordable enough. So the challenge for the industry in the next uh, three to four years is to absorb the additional cost of electrification to protect affordability and make sure that middle classes can buy pure EVs uh, at an affordable price, which means that the transformation of the industry is just starting. In fact, we are live now, transforming our company uh, in a way that needs to be reasonably deep because new technologies are in, software platforms, many electric components, autonomous vehicles, all of this costs a lot of money. And at the same time, you need to bring affordability to the middle classes, which means that if we do not do our homeworks, in terms of productivity, then in that case, uh, you will not be able to compete because some of the new entrants will show you that uh, your cost competitiveness will not be enough. So do we need to make sure that we protect our companies by doing more cost competitiveness? I would say, of course, yes. I would like to remind you that Stellantis as a break-even point, which is the benchmark of the industry, as our break-even point is at 40% of revenues, 40%. You're, you're taking down the clock zero. a little bit longer with a very long-winded answer, so can I ask it again with 40 seconds left? Does that mean job cuts? It means that we are not excluding anything from the task of absorbing the cost of electrification. Okay. Carlos, thanks for your time today. Just wonderful. Enjoyed that conversation. Thank, Thank you, sir. Have a great day. Bye. Carlos Tavares of Stellantis. That's going to be the hot button issue. For the European manufacturers, Tom. huge, huge, and Massive. the U.S. manufacturers are dealing with it as well. But what's Massive. so important is carry it over to the tensions in China. That could have been a two-hour conversation. You want to offer EV credits and the transformation of business that's going to lead to job cuts in the manufacturing business in in autos. Ah, let's oh. see how that goes. And there are fewer employees required for EV manufacturing, so this is an actual logical consequence. Futures right now positive, two tenths. This is Bloomberg. Three-day losing streak on the S&P 500. Equity futures shaping up as follows. We look to snap that up a couple of tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, up four tenths of 1%. Coming off the back of the worst day of the year. 
on equity markets. Year to date, the S&P up something like 4%. Now the Nasdaq up close to 10% still. The two-year yield get to the bond market. Twos, tens, thirties look like this. The two-year yield yesterday, the highest going back to 2007. <coughs> Yields come back in this morning by six basis points, 466.43 after closing through 470 in yesterday's session. We were inching closer and closer to 4% on a 10-year now, 392.34, down about three basis points there. But Tom, to your point, the whole curve yesterday, twos out to 30, just, yeah. just shifted higher yeah. by 10 basis points or and, so. And to get a little, I, you know, I hate the spread market analysis, but let's go there right now. We had a negative 92 basis points on the difference in yield between the twos and the tens um, spread, and that has gone from negative 90 to negative 74, which is an indication of that shift up in a flatter uh, Yield curve. Lisa, did I do okay there? You did great. You got Thank a pass. You. Well done. Flying okay. colors. I want to finish on foreign exchanges briefly. <laughs> just and take, take a look at your dollar. I just knew we'd move on too quickly. I want to squeeze this in. I just, why do we leave Tavares behind us here? You when, want Carlos when, to carry on talking? I just want to get to Beirut March 3rd or 5th. He'd still, be asking, it he'd still be answering that question about job cuts. <laughs> and you came back. You need to I said, well, everything. that's American. I said, the British uh, kid's becoming American. No, just keep on going. Exactly. Still going. No, he doesn't realize the interview's finished. Anyway, can I go back to Euro? I knew this would happen. <laughs> Please. Thank you. 106.41. So the high of the year was 110.33, and it came the day before, the day of the ECB and the day before the jobs report. And this is what makes the Fed minutes really dated a little bit later. If you go through all the data points that we've had since that Fed meeting, whether it's the payrolls on that Friday, what we got, 517,000, and unemployment dropped to 3.4%. If it's the big jump we saw in the ISM services index for January, CPI not dropping as quickly as anticipated, PPI, an upside surprise, retail sales month on month with a three handle, and a first look at the PMI for February, Lisa, is the boom time of January confirmed by the February data? This is how stale those minutes are. It's a conundrum. Wrapped in. in <laughs> honestly, I'm going to keep saying that. And honestly, the <laughs> earnings that are coming out just confirm that view of confusion because we just got TJX, <clears throat> which is a discounted uh, retailer and much better than expected results across the board. You saw net sales Shucks. come in at $14.5 billion versus about a $14 billion expectation. You saw the EPS for the fourth quarter, 89 cents versus 78 cents year over year. So all of this uh, <clears throat> really positive. Those shares up, not that much, but a half a percent. But really, it comes in the heels of negative outlooks with respect to uh, Walmart and Home Depot, it's a different buyer yeah. base. And a listener here, Al from New Jersey, thank you so much for emailing in. He was in a Marshalls in New Jersey yesterday and said it's bubbling. And the difference here, Lisa, is this is not Home Depot. This is not, you know, some big platform. This is a grind it out closed company at discount. And the comp sales beat is really impressive. Indeed. Should we look at some of the other earnings that I've been looking do. at? Okay. He's, he's never been to a TJ Maxx have, in his life. I have gone to lots of TJ Maxx's. Have you ever you know been? In the UK, it's TK Maxx. Really? I found that very confusing. When Wait, I moved TK Maxx, it's got your name all over it. Okay, let's look at some of the others. That's Overstock. So true. Overstock, I'm looking at that. Uh, those shares down as they report net revenue for the fourth quarter that missed the average analyst estimates. Those shares lower by 8.2%, very tied to the housing market. So, how much is that part of what's going on? Also, do you remember when they had this sort of like crypto aspect? They mentioned that they're going to accept cryptocurrencies and then their stocks boomed during the pandemic and now it's the other way. Coinbase uh, shares are a little bit higher. Basically, people, I guess, optimistic uh, that they can continue to generate some gains with the uh, observance of Bitcoin, although it was down a lot before, so I can't really make much of that. And CoStar Group, talking about that uh, lack of sales, this is a, a commercial real estate company down 14.4% dealing with the potential declines in revenues and seeing pretty negative forecasts going forward. This, to me, is fascinating, considering the fact that fourth quarter revenue tumbled 75% for that company compared to the year earlier period. So, Tom, you want to know where it is? Yeah. That's where it is in terms of housing market pain. Do you have Intel up there yet, Lisa? We're sort of doing this in real time. Uh, this I don't. Intel was stunning and, might I add, historic headlines uh, this morning. They reaffirm their Q1 guidance. Help me, folks, here. I'm reading this for the first time. Cut the dividends. So. Fit. They cut the dividends substantially from 36.5 to 12.5 uh, cents. There's the usual McKinsey babble. I'm using that because McKinsey's in the news as well. Something about five nodes. They're going to they're gonna do something with some strate strategy. Well, but this is just, this is an iconic company, Lisa, that's really challenged. Yeah, and NVIDIA is reporting after the bell. What I find interesting is the stock reaction isn't much. 
They cut their quarterly dividend, dividend dramatically, mm -hmm. and the shares are lower by three tenths of a percent. Are people saying this is a good thing? Put that money toward other things, and perhaps this is the kitchen sink. Didn't we say that the I, last I, time they reported earnings? I, Intel, six percent per year for the last ten years. I mean, the answer is, uh, it, it's been a train wreck. From I don't have the stock price in front of me. I'm going to say from sixty-five down to thirty. You know, as a general statement. Yeah, not a great earnings release either <clears throat> early yeah. this year. So there well, you go. There you are. The way we do earnings, we do them in real time here. And thank you for watching us for earnings. Right now, we're going to shift back to bond market, which is where all of Global Wall Street is focused. Marilyn Watson joins us now, head of Global Fundamental Fixed Income Strategy at BlackRock. Marilyn, with your Cambridge parchment, I want to go to Dr. L. Arian of Queens College in the game theory that L. Arian is known for, which is there's at some point where you have to make a T decision. What is the T decision now for investors in bonds with the gyrations, with price down, yield up, the new push up, the shift up in the yield curve that we see? What is your T decision at BlackRock in bonds? So now, I mean, as you say, with yields considerably higher than they had been, and I think, you know, we've seen over the last few days again that the market is continuing to really focus on where the terminal rate might be in the U.S. and elsewhere also how long uh, rates will remain elevated for a prolonged period of time. Also, when you look at the level of um, you know, cash and what you can get for that as well, the decision for investors really is looking at the carry that you can get in your portfolio, the income to match your liabilities, the interest rate and duration risk, and how you can really get the returns that you want and the income that you want. And this is versus cash, uh, not versus risk assets anymore. So when you're looking at, you know, uh, you know, the rate, the risk-free market, when you're looking at uh, the bond market, it's really focusing on getting very high quality, decent carry and comparing that to what you can get for cash and ensuring that you really are getting the returns that you want. So at what point do you extend out into duration? We were talking with Brian Weinstein earlier, and he was basically saying, now is the time. Start shifting out. We're seeing nearly 4% uh, 10-year yields. Do you agree? So we are slightly increasing um, our duration very tactically. I think now is the time we're starting to lock in a little bit more of that carry um, as we do, you know, we're obviously continuing to see, you know, very strong inflation data. Um, you know, overall economic activity remains robust. Um, but we are starting to get to the point where we do see the terminal rates on the horizon. We do think that the economy will slow and will continue to slow from here. And so I think now is starting to become the time where, you know, it is maybe the time to sort of lock in a little bit more, but just being very cautious and being very cognizant that the Fed clearly is also being very, very data dependent. And it's made it crystal clear that it will, you know, keep rates <coughs> elevated and above the neutral rate for a prolonged period of time. Tom mentioned Mohamed El Arian, and he was on with John last week talking about how this Fed would have to choose between either torpedoing the economy or allowing inflation to rest at, say, a 3 percent level and not a 2 percent level. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? I mean, do you think that ultimately we will end with a higher inflation rate, perhaps over the next 10 years, than the Fed would like? So I think the Fed has been trying to tread that very, very fine line and has obviously shifted down its increments from now to 25 basis point hikes. We think that we could see, you know, potentially, you know, a few more, but we think the bar is very high for it to actually um, step rates up in higher increments than that because it is very cognizant that it doesn't want to torpedo the economy. Ideally, it will bring inflation down in a, you know, a steady, sustainable fashion, but it doesn't want to torpedo the economy. The labor market remains very, very strong. And I think, you know, the, the Fed is doing its, obviously its utmost to make, to make sure that inflation does come down. And we do think that inflation mm -hmm. will actually start to tick down in the second half of this year. But it is a very fine line. And, you know, the, the Fed is in a very, very tricky position. Right. But I think the Fed, of course, it doesn't want to complete the economy and it will do its best if it can to bring inflation down to a steady point. But it is possible right. that inflation could remain, you know, for a prolonged period of time above the 2% rate. And, you know, obviously it's already shifted its target, um, you know, to, to be more right. of an average position rather than a 2% position. So it could remain above 2% for a while. Marilyn, away from your remit, maybe, but I'm going to do this because Katie Martin in the FT had a great summary of the death and perhaps relife of the 60-40 uh, portfolio. Mm -hmm. And in it, Ms. Martin had a scattered out chart showing just how ugly 2022 was. Do you have a belief that bonds can be a constructive part of a diversified, allocated portfolio for the next three years? 
Yes, I certainly think the bonds can have a very constructive part in a diversified portfolio. I think actually now, um, more than any period for a very, very long time, as you say, 2022 was um, a very poor year for both, uh, you know, for both bonds and equities. And I think now looking forward in this environment where we do see very decent yields, um, when we can lock in, say, very decent carry for high quality bonds with very little interest rate risk, then I think when you're looking at an overall diversified portfolio, you can get so much more now in the bond market. It's, it's a far more attractive than it has been for a very long time. If you go back, you know, two years, 10 years, when you look at, um, you know, the, the central banks and suppression that they had yep. on, on interest rates and on carry and on the bond market. And yes, you got the, um, you know, the, the, the price appreciation, but the actual carry that you got in the bond market, you know, was, was pretty low. And of course, that you know, funneled uh, money into risk assets. Now we're seeing a very different environment. And I think that bonds now play a very important role in a diversified um, portfolio. Marilyn, and just I quickly, that word diversified, is that uncorrelated diversification? Because what we witnessed yesterday, we were told at the start of this year, we'd get a break between equities and bonds, and that hasn't happened. Is that going to be uncorrelated diversification with treasuries? <laughs> Yeah, so I think it is important to focus on um, less correlations, and I think we will see correlations. Um, we, we, we're still continuing to see this strange dynamic at the moment, and we've seen it again this week in terms of bonds um, and rates as well. But I do think as we move on in the, in the business cycle, um, we will see less correlation, and it's incredibly important to focus on aspects of beta, to focus on correlations, and to really understand the drivers of the returns of a specific bond, a specific equity. And I do think that's an incredibly important part of a portfolio now, yes. Marilyn, this was great, as always. Don't be a stranger. It's good to catch up. Marilyn Watson there of BlackRock on this bond market. We're waiting for that break, aren't we, Bramo? Where is it? Yeah, I mean, let's see. I don't know. I'm, I'm Treasury's curious. up. Stock's up. Treasury's yeah, down. Yeah, I don't know. Stock's I think down. that it's going to take perhaps a terminal rate that's established before we get that back. And we're still trying to establish that, aren't we? Getting closer, there, I'm told. Was, there, there it's was through some, five at least. Yeah. That was some, that correlation question, that was some real University of Warwick finance there. You Warwick. Were Warwick. There. Warwick, you got that. Exactly. Very Omega. Nice. Thanks Very, for that. You know, not Egg Omega, like Omega Omega. Mm. This, you nailed that. Okay. That's Appreciate good. that, Tom. I think. DS Futures <laughs> for third. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Today's release of Federal Reserve minutes are likely to show how much support there is for larger interest rate hikes. The question is whether more officials considered a 50 basis point hike at the last meeting. And the tone could hint at how policymakers are interpreting recent data on inflation. The European Union has slashed its natural gas demand this winter by almost a fifth. That beats a voluntary 15 percent goal that was aimed at helping it survive the winter with lower gas flows from Russia. Finland saw the biggest drop. Usage there was cut by more than half. In South Africa, the stricken power utility company ESCOM will get $13.9 billion in debt relief from the government over the next three years. In return, ESCOM must partially privatize the country's electricity transmission network and co-fired plants. Now, it also must improve its performance. Since 2008, ESCOM has imposed blackouts that have rocked South Africa's economy. Tesla is prioritizing battery cell production in the U.S. over its factory in Germany. The reason? President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, which includes manufacturing tax breaks. The new law's incentives have fueled concerns that Europe will fall behind in the race to attract production of electric vehicle components. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. What we've seen in the most recent quarter is that we've actually had share gain from some of the lower and middle income buckets as well. And so as these consumers are being more discerning, as they're looking for value, and importantly, in a world where convenience really matters, our value proposition is resonating with them. Lots of consumers trading down. That was John David Rainey there, the Walmart CFO and executive VP. Home Depot had a tough time yesterday. Yeah. Not just Walmart. Yes. Home Depot down about 7%. They're forecasting a tougher 
Tougher earnings well, story, Tom, and ultimately higher labor costs as well. 12 seconds on this. What was the distinction between Walmart and Home Depot? The labor story. I would say without a doubt, on top of the outlook, the outlook for both weren't tremendous, but Lisa, ultimately the labor story. Well, we had a guest on yesterday, didn't we? Was yeah. it from UBS? Which one? Carrie Short. Yeah, that's talked, right. Talked about, about the cost to serve was getting more expensive. Yeah. Bottom line. And we heard that just from Stellantis, that basically this is the equation. How do you offset with cost cutting the uh, increase uh, that you're seeing in costs as well as the lack of ability <clears> to pass it along? Home Depot is uniquely problematic simply because they are catering to the housing market. And again, we've seen the pain there. Wrong Swiss bank. Credit Suisse. There we go. Okay. Karen Short, Credit Suisse. Suisse. I wouldn't say that, Tom. <laughs> Not at the moment anyway. <laughs> Getting myself into but trouble. But it was a good Excuse conversation me. yesterday. It was. On the retailers, yeah. He causing more trouble? No, I'm just looking at equities lift off the carnage yesterday. And, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, I, I guess it's a McKee kind of end of the week. There's a lot of economic data coming up. Maybe we'll get some guidance uh, off of that. Three, John, 3.93% in the 10 year yield. I know. You know, it's. Well, like, I got to sevens, I'll give you four. Yeah. Got a six right. month, I'll give you five. What we're going to do now is we do. <laughs> Any we, takers? Keep like going. An option, keep isn't going. It? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Three months, three months, six. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sell cattle. They ever get rid of me. I'd, I'd, John I'd, I'd, I'd love that. Get, sell cattle? Just the cattle auction. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. And then you could make, you know, lemon gelato. Awesome. Nailed it. That's great. That's my I future. Don't... Thanks. Saving us right now is Anisha <laughs> Sherman, Senior Analyst, U.S. Apparel and Specialty Retail at Bernstein. And what's so important here is, is there's always a tendency to focus on fancy luxury. And Anisha Sherman has just first order condition abilities and what real retail is doing from sea to shining sea. She's got real work in retail and, of course, her excellence in securities analysis as well. Did they move inventories, Anisha? Off of the gloom of 90 days ago, did TJ Maxx and the rest of that world, did they move the stuff out the door? Yes, they have. And TJ Maxx outperformed on comp for the Marmax chain, which is Marshalls and TJ Maxx. That's the core two banners. Um, their comp was fantastic. It was a plus seven um, versus expectations of kind of a plus three to four. And um, and and so this, yes, the performance on the on the comp, on the traffic, on inventory moving was right. strong. Uh, margins were a little disappointing, but the sales came in. What is the path forward if we're in a new rate regime? where all of a sudden money costs something and they have a carry on all of their retail. What does your world look like forward? Is it a block and tackle quarter to quarter move or can there be some real vision? No, I think for the for the lower end retail, for the value retail that really got killed last year, um, they're looking at a really strong 2023 recovery because their comps last year were so weak. Um, the lower income consumer was more pressured last year. Fuel costs have come down sequentially, though inflation hasn't. And so they should be expecting stronger performance in the coming year than they did a year ago. Now, that's very different from some of the more premium brands that did fantastically last year and are now facing the tough comparables. Is this just a comparison type of story or is this something deeper that has to do with the fact that people are trading down? People are looking to cut costs in their own lives and might be looking at a discounter rather than a Nordstrom's. Yes, we've heard that narrative from companies for the last several months now. People are more cautious. They're more likely to buy on deal, less likely to buy full price. Um, kind of considering the, the weight of the purchase a little bit more than they were, say, a year ago when they were happy to spend and happy to pay full price and getting out of the COVID mindset. Um, so there is a lot more caution in the market. I think that will benefit TJX and its peers, Ross and Burlington, which report next week. So I don't think it's just about anniversary soft comps. comps. I think it's also a sequential improvement in demand. How big will that divergence become, uh, particularly in the share price as well as the earnings as the year goes on? Because I'm looking right now, TJ Maxx down uh, just a touch on the year so far, not including today's pop. And then you look at Nordstrom and it's up more than 20 percent on the year. Will that reverse? Will you see the reverse kind of correlation? I don't know if we'll see off pricers derate because they, um, you know, they didn't do as well last year. TJX was an exception. TJX was up 6% last year, beat the market, beat the sector. So it's, you know, it's fairly well valued at the moment. Um, I think we'll see continued upward momentum on Ross and Burlington that still ended last year down and so are recovering from that.
Anisha, we've been joking about how we could have just had a meteorologist on pretty much for every segment at the end of last year, and it could have probably given us better uh, landscape for what we were to expect this year. How much does weather feature into this? And I want to say not with people going to stores, but with respect to the gasoline price and the price of utilities going down, giving people more discretionary spending. Yeah, I think it is a big part of it. I think especially for these lower income focused retailers, the value retailers, any relief to the lower income consumer, whether it's easier fuel prices or fewer trips um, or lower inflation or lower sequential inflation, any relief goes straight to the bottom line in terms of spend because yeah. they really have come under pressure, these consumers. And so any relief helps them spend a little bit more. So, um, so anything uh, weather related that will drive a little bit of relief on gas prices would certainly help. Somewhere there's the middle, Anish, the distance from Dior to TJX. There's got to be a middle ground. I haven't understood for 20 years what the middle ground of retail does. After the pandemic, maybe we're overstored. There's some mall issues as well. What do all the players in the middle do? I think the middle is in a really tough situation right now. That is the kind of middle end or slightly lower end department stores, some of the um, mainline retailers that are kind of mainstream retailers. I think they're in a tough spot because they are going to see some trade down going to value, but they are not immune to uh, consumer pressure the way the high luxury brands are, which are continuing to perform. So I think they are going to get squeezed. We're going to see more store closures um, and more um perhaps more bankruptcies through the rest, through the next 12 months or so. Anisha, we had this explosion of buy now, pay later. One of those brands were, I believe, a firm, and I think a firm came out with some big job cuts in the last couple of weeks. Anisha, that helped a lot of people fund some big purchases to make them just say a monthly payment. Anisha, have you seen any of that start to tail off, start to fade? And what does that mean for the bottom line of some of these big players? Yeah, we have. We have seen, you know, Macy's has said, for example, for their own credit cards, payments are down, carrying balances are higher month to month. So I think the demand for something like buy now, pay later is probably still there, but the supply is probably coming down because of rates. So I think we will see that. And that's probably part of what we're seeing in terms of the consumer caution is there's less easy access to financing <clears throat> and funding. Interesting. Anisha, thanks for that. Appreciate it. And great to catch up with you, Anisha Sherman of Bernstein. That last point is a really important one, Tom. All those lines that you see at luxury stores, a lot of people going in there. It's buy now, pay later online. Oh, yeah. You can oh, buy yeah. a really no expensive item, it. just make it a monthly payment. No question. All of a sudden, the... something that's just totally unaffordable, yeah. thousands of dollars, is just like, yeah, $100 yeah. a month. And you're seeing credit card receivables go up, and you're starting to <clears> legacy <throat> rates slowly tick up. But you're right. How much do we see that buy now, pay later disappear? I, I you know, and I look at Kohl's, which KSS, which is, you know, what, what Anish was talking about there. Or even if you go upscale to Nordstrom's, I mean, Nordstrom's 10-year track record is a negative 6.9% per year. Why are you in business? I don't, I don't get it. I, don't, I just don't I mean I get it. It's a family. I mean, that's the answer. But the whole middle ground of retail, I just, it's a mystery oh, It's to been me. tough for how long now? Uh, 20 years. A long yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I just. The thing I've never understood, and just to sort of make a bit of a transition, you know, when you you go up, say, say Lexington Avenue in New York, or for that matter, Madison. I mean, pick an avenue at the moment. I've never been on Madison. All the Avenue. empty storefronts. Yeah. Still, at least I've still. I ask the same question. I ask this all the time whenever I walk down them. How? Like at some point, don't you have to cut the price to the rent to try and get someone in there? And I'm told that there's a lot of people invested in this real estate. Right. They're looking for write-offs. Exactly. I just don't get it. That's a great question. I've talked to people about it. Basically, you can do a tax deduction based on lost revenue if you don't rent it out. If you rent it out, you've got to lock in a rate that is subpar, and then well, you have to next year lock that into your this has been uh, years interest of this rate expectation. Now. Exactly, but They're this is going to do this indefinitely. At what point does this become a political issue to say you have to change the scenario to revive an area that's? been kind of decimated. I mean, you look around, uh, you look at entire areas in yeah, Midtown yeah. that have no activity in terms of storefronts that are open. Major shout out to Cranes, which especially is talking about real estate in the island of Manhattan and other cities as well. And what you're talking about, John, is the Cranes unspoken. Nobody really wants to talk about empty storefronts. I'll talk said, about the 15th floor, the 50th floor, but they don't want to talk about the first You floor. came back after the long weekend and you said to me, Midtown Retail. It's, it's, it's changed. It's, it's, it's just changed. gone. It's just, it, the, the spirit is different. Equity futures right now up a quarter of 1%. Michael O'Rourke of Jones Trading coming up next.
we are now expecting inflation to overall continue to decrease uh, throughout this year, despite the fact uh, that the last reading has been a little stronger than expected. The consumer is extremely strong. Uh, companies' balance sheets are extremely strong. But U.S. consumers are not really being hurt by high rates. There's going to be a pause. I mean, you cannot annualize the degree of performance we've had this year. It's possible that we'll go into, into a recession, but I would say the recession uh, will most likely be mild. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramowitz, and Tom Keene. Thank you so much for being with us on a Wednesday on radio, on television, in the markets. It is a bond move and also the diplomacy of Europe. And, John, I want to link this into the financial world now. Read the Munich Re website. We have Putin and Wang talking in Moscow. We have Biden talking with Budapest 9. And the Munich Re insurance company announces with profitability a 1 billion euro buyback. And read their website about Eastern Europe and continental Europe during the time of the Nazis. It is a history organization on what Munich Re did, did, did different than all the other German companies, and it speaks to the tension that we face in 2023. Well, let's speak to the moment of this week Yeah. in terms of geopolitics and what we've seen from President Biden going into Ukraine to kick off the week on President's right. Day talking about solidarity with the Ukrainian people, worried, almost nervous about whether China gets involved directly in this war by funding and providing direct assistance to Russia. And then this headline crossing earlier on this morning, Wang Yi, China's top diplomat, saying the relations with China and Russia are solid as a rock. Tom, I think that speaks to the tension between the United States and China more than anything else this morning. And underreported because it's in Russian was Putin's speech, which I heard from Robert Service and other true Russian experts, was the most chilling speech they've heard back to Stalin. And just to link this again into the finance of Munich Re and the recovery of Germany, I mean, they came out after the war and were relatively the first to make reparations to Jewish uh, people that lost property in Germany. I mean, the tension here, as you mentioned, with your Scholes question two hours ago, where are Scholes? There are delicacies in this delicate time. Look, I think we are still, still in a world somewhere. It's an incredibly low probability event that we end up in a proxy war between the U.S. and China. Yes. But it's still got a probability assigned to it that isn't zero, and we need to discuss it. And if that takes place, I just wonder yeah. where that leaves Chancellor Schultz of Germany and what his position is going to be on it all. And you, and you fold this in, Lisa, to the tensions in the bond market. You know, we're all, are, are we all in agreement the last 90 days have been absolutely nuts in the financial markets? I think that's true. In the bond market And to me, it's yeah. all linked into this war anniversary to a Europe in recovery and obviously bringing it back to Munich Re and, and the rest, people just trying to survive through this. It's the mystery of pandemic economics mixed with the exogenous risk of an ongoing war and the potential for escalation. And what that means is people believed in immaculate disinflation until they didn't. You saw a terminal rate priced in at 4.8% until it went to 5.3%. 5.4% almost 5 .4%. at one point. It's wow. been whipping around. I mean, now it's back down to 5.3. But people are gaming out a scenario where suddenly right. the strength from a warmer than expected winter enters the sphere of this muddle that we have with pandemic yeah. economics and then the geopolitics, which really does raise a sort of existential issue going forward. John, the 10 year yield near 4%. You do better on this than, than I do. Is there anyone modeling price down yield up through what we saw in October of last year? Well, we're going there now. We're getting there, there the last quickly. 24 hours. Yeah. Intraday, we've not got there yet. So intraday, I think it was early November on payrolls Friday, where we got to close to 480 on a two-year yield. We came just short of that in yesterday's session, but on a closing basis, the highest level since 07 on a two-year, and right the way across the curve, twos out to 30s. Whole curve just shifted higher by more than 10 basis points, Tom, in yesterday's session. Bond market looks like this this morning. We come in about two basis points a on a 10-year, just a little bit. But yeah. TK, we're still close, aren't we, to 4%, oh, yeah. 3.92, oh, yeah. I mean, 73. Yes yesterday was something, and John, we've become um, we've moved away from that accommodation, Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. Positive 0.14 is a long way from that positive 0.50 effort we tried to get to. Worst out of the year in the equity market yesterday on the S&P. <clears throat> Futures positive two-tenths of 1%. Fed minutes out at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to hear from New York Fed President John Williams a little bit later as well. <clears throat> Was that 5.30? Yeah, 5.30 p.m. A little bit later this afternoon. I've said all morning, I think those minutes from the Federal Reserve are pretty stale, given what we've had on the data front between the last meeting in. and now. I got this <laughs> message from Stuart Hampton on Twitter just moments ago. They're not stale if they're hawkish. 
is what he said. <laughs> and, uh, I think, I think yeah. that's the bias at the moment, is it? If it's dovish, it's like, yeah, but they didn't have all this data. It's hawkish. Wow, they must be really hawkish. People are looking for some sense of whether they're upping their terminal rate. Will the Fed massage the minutes? You're laughing about that. But there is this idea that they can push them in a certain direction, and that will perhaps feed into the hawkish bet that people are looking for. Tom? I'm just, I, I'm just looking at what I, I just I really can't say enough as we go into this hour with Ed Hyman and, and Michael O'Rourke here in moments, John. The stew here, and yet there's a venerable company, Munich Ray, just saying, forget about it. We're going to buy back shares. In tons of buybacks, Tom. Yeah. Loads of that. Uh, but the um, labour pressure, don't forget the labour pressure. I think the labour pressure in the last in retail, 24 hours yeah. in retail yeah. is something we really need yeah. to keep an eye on. It wasn't a massive story a year or so ago because they could pass it on. They could pass it on in pricing power. We didn't really witness that in these releases yesterday. Let's dive into it now with Futures Up 8. The VIX out to 23, 23.14 in the VIX. Michael O'Rourke joins us, Chief Market Strategist at Jones Trading. M Michael, to the broader theme there of a German reinsurer with a huge buyback, mm -hmm. and yet all the tangible gloom out there, is the O'Rourke glass half full or half empty? Oh, I'm, I'm definitely in the half empty camp here. I think we've had an incredible corrective rally in a bear market over the past four months. And I think we're probably ready to resume that downtrend that's probably going to last most of the year. So how do you push back against people who say, we've seen a real strengthening in the economy. We've seen both growth uh, increased in terms of the expectation, but also Fed rate hikes. Why don't you just basically lean into that, given that a lot of companies are doing, to quote Tom, better than good? Well, I, I wouldn't even say they're doing better than good, because when you think about the situation we're in, uh, we do have economic strength. We had economic strength in January, and the, the preliminary PMIs reported yesterday look like it's carrying over to February. And we still see, you know, basically hot economic data, still high inflation levels. And, but on the flip side, you, you have Home Depot and Walmart yesterday say earnings are going to be down year over year this year. So you're looking at an environment where the Fed does need to be tighter. Um, we only just moved to a positive real Fed funds rate earlier this month, and we still have a, a, an inflation problem. So you're looking at, at you know, an out, a policy outlook that's just going to be very unfriendly going forward. And again, the fundamentals for companies are, you know, they're slowly deteriorating, I guess is the best way to describe it, but they're not improving. What will it take for big tech to underperform again, given the incredible outperformance earlier this year? Oh, I, I think we're probably going to enter that phase here. We have interest rates rising again. People realizing that you know inflation is not under control. Um, I think you you touched it in your in your you know the conversation you you just had about um, what's going on in Europe and and between you know the China and the U.S. Yeah, there may not be a proxy war, but we are seeing deglobalization themes. And I, I, you know, I'm still a big believer that China entering the WTO in 2001, you know, created that um, stable, low inflation environment of the past two decades. And we're not going to have that going forward. So it's just it's going to be a much more challenging environment. For the past 15 years, we've had a negative real Fed funds rate on average of over you know, one and a quarter percent. That's not going to be the case going forward, and that's going to be harder for investors. Does that get you to a blended single-digit return? And can I say with, with more pension-like money, do you actually have to reduce your actuarial assumption? I, I would say I think you do. I think we've had this just beneficent environment for the past uh, 15 to, you know, post basically post-global financial crisis of the Fed had this latitude of continually being able to ease and pump liquidity into the market uh, any time, any sign of weakness. We don't have that, that flexibility, they don't have that flexibility anymore to react like that. You know, they have to be concerned that um, if, they, if they're at all, you know, accommodative or even showing less vigilance on inflation, that uh, you're gonna see inflation expectations uptick. Uh, we still have a high inflation environment. It's something they definitely have to get under control. Um, and we're still just not there yet. If you had to take a guess, let's say we're at 470 right now on a two year. Do you think it's more likely we get to 530 first or is it more likely we get to something like 420? Uh, well, it's funny, we were just at 420, right? So. Um, it's interesting. If you look at the three-month annualized rate of inflation, uh, of course, CPI, 
Uh, over the past three months, it averaged between four and five percent. If you go back over the past 40 years, every time we've had inflation at those levels, I'm not talking about the high inflation levels of the 70s. I'm talking between four and five percent. You've seen interest rates, you know, 250 to 300 basis points higher than where they are today. And I think that's one of the reasons inflation is still going to be sticky until we get rates a, a bit higher here. You're looking at an environment where you'd have a real Fed funds rate of 300 basis points as opposed to 22, 23 basis points that we have today. Yeah. So from that type of environment going forward, I think it's going to be I think you're going to see rates go higher. OK. Was that basically a call to say the next 50 basis points is higher than not lower, Mike? I would say so, yes. Wow. That's a call. So for the next 10% of the equity market, you'd say 10% lower, right? Not 10% higher. Lower. Abso yeah. Absolutely. Michael O'Rourke there, Jones Traded. Thank you, sir. Just trying to work out the balance of risk for a lot of people, where they think the next big moves come from. Tom. Heads are spinning. The balance of risk is after the data we saw without a doubt. Your heads are spinning. I mean, I mean, you know, we're been busting uh, Bramos chops all morning about conundrum and enigma, but she's absolutely dead on. I'm conundrum sorry. wrapped in an enigma. Well, yeah, I like it's that. Poetic, but that's but beautiful. it's also true. Thanks. Now that's going to be in a promo now yeah. for the rest of the year. <laughs> conundrum wrapped in an enigma. That's great. Watch we'll, Bloomberg we'll surveillance. That's awesome. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> that's absolutely terrible. Yeah, I, I do think though that this is going to be, in terms of the next big move, a lot of it's going to be also tied to big tech, and that to me is sort of this interesting outperformance. I just, you know, how much have people really gotten out of that position? Can you imagine 520, 50 basis points higher on a two-year? 520 I on a two-year? I think there's year? a lot <laughs> of the public that, John, they wow. can't imagine. Can't no. imagine. We've no. been there. Amazing. Yeah, nice. Futures right now positive. A tenth, two tenths of 1% higher on the S&P 500, 8.30 Eastern time. Don't miss this. I might. But that's because I've got to be somewhere else. But don't miss this. <laughs> Ed Hyman That's of also Evercore. That's the promo. <laughs> Coming up in minutes. I mean, I felt bad teasing it, but, you know, don't miss this. I sold and, that, John. And it won't be it. Don't miss this. Ed Hyman's coming up. Looking forward to hearing that conversation. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with The First Word, I'm Lisa Mateo. We may get a sense of how many Fed policymakers saw the case for a larger interest rate increase at their last meeting. The central bank will publish minutes of that gathering at 2 p.m. New York time. They may also show whether Fed officials anticipated the need to take rates higher than previously thought to tame inflation. In Poland, President Biden is meeting with Eastern European leaders who have supported Ukraine. Those countries have sent weapons to Ukrainians and taken in millions of refugees who were fleeing Russia's war. President Biden returns to Washington today. China's top diplomat calls relations with Russia solid as a rock. The remarks by Wang Yi come as Beijing is trying to portray itself as a neutral actor that can broker peace in Ukraine. Wang met with Vladimir Putin in Moscow. Meanwhile, the Wall Street Journal says China's President Xi Jinping is preparing to visit the Russian capital. The biggest maker of computer processors, Intel, is slashing its dividend payment by 66 percent. The company wants to preserve cash for investment. Now, in its earnings report last month, Intel forecast one of the worst quarters in its history. Chip companies have been hammered by a steep drop in demand for personal computer processors. And the Biden administration will cut mortgage insurance costs for, for some first-time home buyers. The program will be unveiled today. Borrowers with mortgages insured by the Federal Housing Administration will see their fees cut by about $800 a year, or three-tenths of a percentage point. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I regret today's decision by Russia to suspend its participation in the new START treaty. President Putin is in no way preparing for peace. He's preparing for more war, he's preparing for uh, new offensives, and uh, he is mobilizing more uh, troops and sending in more uh, weapons. And that's exactly why we need to step up our support uh, for Ukraine. Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General there, addressing the world. Russia firing back in, in more ways than one, Tom in the last couple of days. Some yep. pretty fiery language from Vladimir Putin, a Russian leader, getting an endorsement from China, calling the relationship with Russia rock solid this morning. Tom, that's quite a striking headline. 
given what we've seen over the last couple of days. And the video images, which we haven't shown yet, are, are, are really something. I mean, this is in a you know, typical Kremlin-like white room, white table, except Putin's not sitting at one time zone and the other guy's sitting <laughs> at the other time zone. It's, you know, images matter. They're right across the table from each other being fraternal. It's tough to confront the counterfactual, Tom, but I do wonder whether we would have heard that headline this morning from China's top diplomat if we hadn't had the issues we have had over the last couple of weeks between China and the United States <clears throat> and that alleged spy balloon that traversed this country. Would we have heard that language from China's top diplomat this question. morning saying that? Basically, is this way for tit for tat, right? Basically ratcheting up some of the tensions and saying, you know, we want to get involved and show our, our, our strength and your potential weakness in this type of situation. That if you aren't going to play ball with us, that we're going to ratchet up tensions on this side. How much is it sort of a negotiating tool from China? The relationship is solid as a rock, Tom. And we'll stand the trials of the changing international situation. I think there was another headline earlier this morning that said we won't be influenced, pressured by a third party. And I think we all know who that third party is when they say that. And, and again, traveling back to uh, Washington will be President Biden. Traveling back through London will be Henry Horton, our chief Washington uh, correspondent. For America, we're going to take advantage of Ms. Horton's commitment to really learning and understanding the history of the continent all the way out to Siberia, which she's done for years with Bloomberg. Henry Horton, I want to talk about the elephant that's not in the room, and that is we talk <laughs> about the Budapest Nine Except the guy from Budapest isn't there. I, you know, I, I don't know if it's Bucharest, Bucharest Budapest. Nine. It's Bucharest. Let's talk about the Budapest Nine. And the answer is the guy from Budapest, Orban, is not there. This is really important when you look at the Budapest Nine. This is important. I mean, Viktor Orban has been a rebel, someone obviously say, someone who's dragged their feet when it comes to sanctions. Just this week, he's talking about the fact that he wants to maintain these economic ties and relations, strong relationship with Moscow. He also is talking about the European Union, saying that when Russia invaded Ukraine, it was the West that has elevated this into a bigger conflict. And he views it, this is Viktor Orban's words, as two Slavic nations fighting against each other. This is something you don't hear from many European leaders. And he is yeah. obviously <clears throat> absent today, the elephant not in the room, as you correctly noted, Tom. Um, he will be sending another delegation. But uh, the FT talked about this as well. There's this urbanization of the Hungarian military industrial complex. And it's very difficult at a time when you have the Biden administration, alongside President Duda and other Western allies, meeting with the Bucharest Nine, wanting to talk about a closer relation of these countries within NATO, and you have Viktor Orban kind of, you know, poking holes right. in this, this, these alliances. Help our American listeners and viewers, Anne-Marie, how unified is the Bucharest Nine? I mean, you think about the bridge in Prague that's so historic to everything in, you know, medieval times and all that. Forget about all the history lesson. How unified are these nine? Well, I think it's pretty clear that these nine are pretty unified in the sense that the day after Putin invaded Ukraine, these nine quickly wanted to coalesce and have a meeting because obviously their concerns being either either part of the so former part of the Soviet Union or were part of the now dissolved Warsaw Pact, they wanted to make sure that, one, this did not go outside Ukraine borders and that they were not next in terms of anything President Putin was thinking in terms of uh, more than adventurism, but absolute invasion of these former Soviet countries. The group was also created after Putin annexed Crimea. It was created in 2015. He annexed Crimea in 2015. Obviously, we saw the fighting in eastern Ukraine since then. So there has been this concern and, and the growing collective concern amongst this group. So I would say they are pretty united in those concerns, but obviously you have a, a spectrum of the President Duda likes and those like uh, uh, Viktor Orban, who's once again uh, really saying that he thinks that these security concerns are, are overblown. I believe that President Biden heads back to Washington, D.C., either later today uh, or early tomorrow. And this comes at a time when he just expressed solidarity with not only the Bucharest Nine, but also all of Europe and saying that they're going to counter Russia. Have there been any tangible takeaways from this other than the ratcheting up in tensions between China and Russia on one side and the U.S. and Europe on the other? 
Well, I think one of the main things to watch out for when the president heads back to Washington, D.C. is something he's flagged and we've even reported on, is that there's going to be another tranche of sanctions against Russia. It's going to be uh, penalties against key industries, potentially more export controls, as well as going after more individuals. So that's one tangible thing we can take away from this trip, as well as more aid to Ukraine. But overall, this trip was really about symbolism. As they have this weariness and fatigue rising amongst countries around the world about the fact that everyone is starting to settle in and realizing this is not a quick conflict. This is going to go on for a long time. President Biden wanted to make clear that the U.S. will remain united with Western allies in providing that funding to Ukraine, but also making sure that they further try to isolate Russia, which is why the split screen is fascinating, because Russia is trying so hard to show they are not isolated, because look who's in town, and it's China's top diplomat. Okay, is it Russia or is it China? And this goes to the question, what message is China trying to say at a time when Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping is trying to say that they want to uh, facilitate some peace talks, and yet they're talking about their unwavering support of Russia. China is playing a two-part game at the moment. Uh, publicly, they obviously are trying to do this quote-unquote peace plans, which is very much so being questioned with a lot of skepticism when you talk to European or U.S. officials. But this is something that the global South, countries in Latin America, countries in Africa, would likely welcome, countries that are struggling with food insecurity and energy insecurity. So this is something the U.S. also needs to make sure globally they try to build up some support to counter that. At the same time, Xi Jinping is trying to be seen as a global statesman, someone that can try to play this hand of be bringing peace. But behind scenes, what is going on is that Xi Jinping has had no problem calling President Putin on the phone a number of times over the course of the past 12 months, but has yet to call President Zelensky. And obviously, the United States has made it pretty clear that they're concerned about Beijing going over a line of not just sending any help to Russia, but lethal help to Russia as they continue to advance this war in Ukraine. Hey, Mace, this was great. I'll catch up with you in the next hour on all of this. Anne-Marie over in Poland today. She'll be in Europe through the rest of this week. Coming up for the next hour, here's a lineup for you in the open on Bloomberg TV, going into the opening bell. Jay Pulaski's coming up of TPW, alongside Daryl Cronk of Wells Fargo. Laurie Calvacina mm. of RBC Capital Markets around the opening bell at 9.30 Eastern time. But Jay Pulaski, very, very constructive on the global equity story. Daryl Kronk, much more so on US equities, Tom. So that's going to be the US versus Europe conversation a little well, bit later in the next hour. Yeah, but I think Mr. Pulaski's also said he was way out front of the medical salvation of China, the China Open, the Pacific Rim Open. And the last time Daryl was sitting right next to us here, I mean, he was just he was great. extremely constructive, like we're going to hear from Ed Hyman here in five minutes, on the American experiment, it can survive given high yields. All these guys are older. You know, we've lived this. They've seen it. You know, but I mean, Ed Hyman loved Bob Seger. He told me that, you know, he was completely all over Bob Seger. On a serious note, Ed Hyman on China and Evercore on China GDP. That's oh, yeah. the call I want to hear. Yeah. They got a big call on that. Big call. They're optimistic on it. I think they peeled it back a little bit, but yeah, optimism. And looking forward to that conversation yeah. coming up in about five under. minutes' time. It's wrapped in an enigma. It is. Who said that? I don't know. Who brilliant. said that? It's poetry. A wise woman once said. <laughs> about two hours ago. No one remembers her. <laughs> Future's positive. <clears throat> this is Bloomberg. Surveillance, Lisa Bramlett's and Tom King. We welcome all of you around the world, across this nation, on radio, on television. It's been an extraordinary day for us. We've been busting Bramlett's chops about conundrum and enigma, but that's what we're hearing guest to guest. I mean, that's the reality. Everyone comes out and says this is the most uncertain time in our entire careers, because how do you game yeah. out the pandemic era, plus what we saw with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, plus what we see with respect to some of the stimulus that we saw globally? Put that together. And there you go. I'm going Absolute to really mess. put it off the once in a lifetime pandemic crisis that we've had. And what we know is it can only be smart conversation. Edward Yard.
had Denny with us earlier with a perspective that's been dead on and no landing. And leading that charge and hugely anticipated for this entire half hour, Edward Hyman joins us today. He is vice chairman at Evercore ISI. We're thrilled that he will have an extended conversation uh, with us. And yes, we'll get to the China call uh, here in a bit. Ed Hyman, thank you so much for your generous time uh, this morning. You say inflation is slowing significantly. David Rosenberg, you knew him at Merrill Lynch, says inflation is slowing significantly. It's on the good side. Do you see service sector inflation slowing? Yes, I do. So there's a hey, Tom. It's, it's great to be on your program. You know, it's, it's a terrific program. At least in John, I've, as I tell you guys, it's just wonderful. But uh, there's a PMI for services, and it's dropped uh, 20 points from 75 to 55. And there are plenty of services uh, that I think are slowing, particularly in the financial services area, insurance, et cetera. And, but that's the key, is to get the measure that PAL watches uh, to slow down. Uh, one of the big services is rents. And uh, I'm convinced they're gonna slow dramatically and maybe even go negative for the shelter CPI. Uh, there are half a dozen measures of rents uh, surveys of rents, and they've all slowed <clears throat> significantly, uh, if not declined, over the past nine months. And they lead the shelter CPI uh, by about eight months. So I'm a couple of months late now on this uh, showing up. But uh, I think the shelter uh, is going to slow. Mm -hmm. And then before you ask it, <laughs> wages are going to slow. If, if McKinsey is laying off people, what can you say? Well, can we make news here today? Is Evercore ISI laying off people? I mean, you know. <laughs> they, they, they may lay off me if inflation doesn't slow. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, well, we've heard this in C.J. Lawrence. And Julian Emanuel, be very careful here with the tough guy, Ed Hyman. <laughs> Ed, I want to cut to the chase, which is the heritage is what you've done since C.J. Lawrence. I mean, it goes back to Wayne Angel. It's about monitoring M2. As you know, M2 is in disrepute let's say over the last decade, why are you following M2 and its collapse so carefully in your research note? So I met Milton Friedman when I was 23 years old. Uh, and in the 70s, uh, he was became a rock star. And every time you had a bout of inflation, uh, money growth accelerated 10, 15%. And so it was an easy connection uh, in that regard. Then getting to today, uh, bank deposits, uh, which are 85% of the money supply, are a practical way to track it every week. Uh, and they have declined significantly. They're down about 2% now. And they've declined 100 billion in the past two weeks. Uh, this is going back to the 1930s to have a situation like this. Now, we found over <coughs> decades that the money supply might not have much of an impact uh, if it's in a normal range, say five to 10%. I think Margaret Thatcher found that out uh, when she was trying to gear monetary policy with Friedman uh, off of swings in the money supply. But last year, the money supply increased almost 30%. The year before that, government outlays increased 50% and the Fed monetized it uh, and now uh, M2 last week was minus 3%, uh, which is a ominous uh, or significant decline. Oh. And it leaves by one in two years. Uh, so it, uh, you, you can't see it on the uh, program you have this, this morning, but it, it's, it's coming. And I think it shows up in some of the slowdown of inflation readings that we're seeing now, like container freight rates, well, you know, natural gas. This really speaks to the long and variable lags, Ed. This discussion around right. the tightening and the removal of accommodation and how long it's going to take before we start seeing it in the data. And as you say, you and many others have been surprised that we are not seeing it more and that you're even seeing a reacceleration in certain inflationary reads uh, in specific segments of the economy. What does long and variable lags look like in 2023 in an era of so many cross currents of different trends? One in two years. That's uh, it. That was uh, standard. It. We, we do a lot of uh, standard it for Milton Friedman. 
uh, we've done uh, a lot of econometric work uh, on uh, global short rates. They lead by one in two years. And if you'll hang on for a second, in 1923, that's 1923, uh, John Maynard Keynes wrote a paper uh, that said the money supply leads by 16 months. Uh, so uh, I've not been, uh, I've, I've been surprised, but I haven't been fighting the idea the economy is strong now because a year ago, Fed funds were zero, zero. QE was in place and the money supply was around 10%. Yeah. Those, you, you know, those are all now totally different. Well, and so that will show up more toward the end of this year and on into 2024, I think. Until we see the long and variable lags actually play out, people are talking about a no landing scenario that we possibly could avoid any kind of recession or downturn or even a significant slowdown and end up reaccelerating into a new bull market. Do you push back against that and say, look, in a year, two years, we're going to see some sort of downturn. And the longer that you have faith in this no landing scenario, the more potentially fraught it could be. Well, on the no landing part, uh, I mentioned long and variable lags, and they're pretty painful. Uh, Reinhard Rogoff wrote a piece in early <clears throat> 2009 criticizing people that had moved to the view that we would have no recession, that the housing weakness would be contained. Uh, and it's different this time, became very popular. And that's what's going to happen. That's what's happening right. now and will continue to happen. Uh, but uh, I I think, judging yeah. by history, it will end up uh, creating a recession yeah. for the end of this year or into 2024. But it's going to be pretty painful and the, the no landing story, I think, is looking at things right now. And right, right now, the economy is doing great. Well, you know, with that, Hyman, folks, and we welcome all of you on radio and television, generous to be with us for this half hour. I do want to point out that there's a full econometric uh, display in his research note, including an R squared of 68 percent on what short <laughs> rates are going to be doing. But to get out front, folks, we protect the copyright of all of our guests. Go to Evercore ISI to get the Ed Hyman, Dick Rippey and the rest of them uh, religion, uh, if you will. Ed Hyman, I want you to speak to those younger they didn't read you at C.J. Lawrence. They barely know your research note at Evercore ISI. They've never faced this rate structure, this return to a real rate. There's a whole feeling life can't go on. Explain how life goes on if we come back to a legitimate interest rate regime. It seems to me, Tom, that we're already getting into an environment where life goes on uh, because the economy is doing so well right now. I know there are lags involved, uh, but the stock market, you know, is pretty uh, contemporaneous, and they know that rates are high. And so I think we're, we're getting there, but it's a learning process. Uh, the Fed, I think, is doing a pretty good job of uh, communicating what their plans are. If I was them, I would pause and see what they've gotten done so far. Right. And then turns out they need to keep going. They can. It turns out they uh, should uh, continue to pause or cut rates. They can do, do that. Right. But I would pause right now given how much water is under the bridge. Ed Hyman, as we speak to you, it is images of the president of the United States meeting with the Bucharest Nine. Of course, this historic moment for Eastern Europe after the president's trip to Ukraine. Ed Hyman, I say this with immense respect, and you remember the politics that we've all faced. How do you overlay the politics of the nation into what has been a multiple decade Hyman optimism? How do you take the challenges of the time of Jimmy Carter, fold them over to the time of Joe Biden and overlay them on a belief in the American economy? Um, that's, that's too much for this morning. Uh, but, you know, I have a, a, a deep respect uh, for democracy, and I'm a conservative, uh, but I I see uh, a benefit in the back and forth that we have going on right now. I think it's too extreme, uh, but uh, it plays a role in our system. And so at the moment, uh, I don't see it being uh, a terrible impediment. Uh, Powell is doing what he's doing. Uh, 
I don't know if you have seen it, but uh, federal outlays are scheduled to decline about 5% this year in 2023. Now, that they went up 50% in 2020. Mm-hmm. So let's, right. so let's, not, let's not celebrate too, too much. Uh, but it, it is a crazy world. Uh, the, the parts that I find most troubling, and I'm sure you do too, is the war situation and also the situation in China, which uh, I'm constructive on. Uh, but they they definitely well, they, they have a more problematic situation politically than we do. And I'm sure you're briefed on a script and that we're going to come back and talk about China, the optimism that Edward Hyman and Evercore ISI has on the global economy and a stunning expectation of China recovery. Ed Hyman will continue with us on Bloomberg Surveillance. Lisa, you know, I, I get almost goosebumps here about the the moment that we're in where we all have this, you know, we've been busting your chops, but this conundrum and enigma and the sum of all our fears. And in the real world, you read the people that you choose to read. And that's what Ed, Ed Hyman has brought over the many years. And the conundrum wrapped in enigma is a butchered uh, rendition of Winston Churchill back in 1939 when he was speaking in an address. Are there the elements Times. of 39 right now? Well, that's the question, yeah. right? We're looking at a moment of well, uh, potential pivotal changes, and hopefully it's not quite the same kinds as 1939. We're going to continue with Ed Hyman. Our Anne Marie Horden is with the president in Warsaw State with Bloomberg through the day. Good morning. Keeping you up to date with the news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Today's release of Federal Reserve minutes are likely to show how much support there is for larger interest rate hikes. The question is whether more officials considered a 50 basis point hike at the last meeting. And the tone could hint at how policymakers are interpreting recent data on inflation. The European Union has slashed its natural gas demand this winter by almost a fifth. And that beats a voluntary 15 percent goal that was aimed at helping it survive the winter with lower gas flows from Russia. Finland saw the biggest drop. Usage usage there was cut by more than half. Tesla is prioritizing battery cell production in the U.S. over its factory in Germany. The reason? President Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, which includes manufacturing tax breaks. The new law's incentives have fueled concerns that Europe will fall behind in the race to attack production of electric vehicle components. In China, authorities have urged state-owned companies to phase out urging using the four biggest international accounting firms. That's a sign there's still concern about data security. The firms include PricewaterhouseCoopers, Ernst & Young, KPMG, and Deloitte & Touche. And how would you like a touch of olive oil added to your cup of coffee? Well, it's happening at Starbucks shops across Italy as the coffee maker struggles to gain traction in the country. The company plans to launch a new Oleato coffee line in the U.S., Japan, Middle East, and the UK later this year. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. take all of the regions globally, we've got the highest return forecast in Asia. Uh, It's partly a valuation story and a recovery, the opening up of China. Um, And secondly, I think you really need to look within and beneath the equity index level to really find better relative opportunity. Peter Oppenheimer is Chief Global Equity Strategist at Goldman Sachs. Can we suggest, Lisa, that, that Pharaoh steals Oppenheimer more often than we get to actually talk to him? Or is it London just saying they have him first? I'll go back and check. I'm, I'm always interested to we hear what to, he has to say. Yes. We get him plenty. We get him plenty. Peter Oppenheimer, they're very, very competent for Goldman Sachs. And, of course, uh, we say good morning to Abby Joseph Cohen, now up at Columbia University, I should point out, is uh, well. What a joy to continue with Ed Hyman. He's vice chairman at Evercore ISI. And, Ed, you stopped traffic here the last time you were on with an optimism on the China reopening. I believe you'd have adjusted real GDP. Where's your number right now on a China reopening? Is it still near 6%? 
we have six at the end of the end of the year. Uh, it's a complicated situation. Uh, actually, a little more complicated than I expected, but we still think it's going to be very strong. They're opening up, and uh, I've, I've learned uh, either the hard way or the easy way that that makes a very big difference. Uh, when we had the pandemic collapse, uh, and China did, I learned from China because their GDP was minus 50. And so I was estimating minus 50 for the U.S., which wasn't too far off. Uh, and then we had a, a big rebound, and GDP was something like 30. And that same in China and in the U.S. And so they have that dynamic coming on now as they reopen. And it seems to be pretty successful. Uh, they've gotten through the pandemic, and a very big percentage of people very big percentage of people have had uh, the virus, and so that they have a herd immunity going on, uh, you know, plus stimulus yeah. uh, working through the system. Uh, well, Ed, how much will that actually trickle into the rest of the global economy, given the increasing isolation of China, both deliberately for a more focus on nationalism versus also an isolation with respect to the fissures that we hear right now with China in Russia? Lisa, I think they'll. I think they'll export. Uh, you know, once they get the factories going, uh, I think they'll uh, be an increased uh, source of exports. Just recently, they became the biggest exporter of uh, vehicles, and so I think they'll do that. I think they're going to push up commodity prices uh, like copper, uh, but then come in and push down. Uh, finish good prices. I will say that I'm watching most closely the price of oil. And that is my uh, North Star as to how China is progressing right now. And uh, oil prices, which I look at on Bloomberg, frankly, all the time, uh, they're pretty quiet right now, around $75 for West Texas. And uh, so that tells me that, uh, that China hasn't gotten uh, ripping ahead yet. So well, I think that's coming. I think oil prices will go up. This is incredibly important because a lot of people have come on this program, Ed, and said that the oil is incredibly muddied in terms of the price signal, given the fact that people are changing to renewables, given the fact that China has increased domestic production of wind, of solar, of even using coal or exporting, uh, importing some of the uh, materials from Australia. Are you saying that that's not true, that oil is the I, cleanest well, Lisa, read I, on what's happening with China? I think that's a fair point. I think it's an excellent point. And... Uh, on the price of oil, uh, just to pick one commodity price, uh, if things like what you're mentioning uh, are true for a number of commodity prices, uh, it could feed into my strong view that inflation is going to be less than what people expect, not to mention the fact that the money supply is contracting. But uh, I think some of these uh, technological advances uh, that you mentioned could you know, put downward pressure on some commodities. Now, a commodity like copper is right in the middle of the technology advances. You need the copper wires uh, to make the technologies work. Uh, but some other commodities, I mean, but watching natural gas, and you can see it made, making new lows both in Europe and in the U.S., mm -hmm. and you can see uh, when that happens, it really helps economic uh, activity on a current basis, right. particularly in Europe. Uh, but I think it's also working a, a little bit here. I mean, Ed, I, I understand that, you know, once a week, maybe once a quarter, you read Julian Emanuel's work at Evercore ISI. But let's dovetail the stock market, the equity market, and ownership of American equities into your uh, economics. With all of this said, are we at a point of 1975 or maybe the great bull market of 1982 where corporations like they did then will adapt and adjust and prosper? Well, first, you know, I, I, we have an open office architecture. And I learned this from uh, Michael Bloomberg. <laughs> this is when you were on uh, Park Avenue. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have, and so I'm uh, cursed with the fact that Julian 
sits, sits right next to me. So I have to put one up with the guy all the time. But uh, he is he is terrific, and thanks to the world of all three of you. Uh, but uh, on uh, the current picture, uh, my view is that inflation is the key. Uh, the Fed is going to keep tightening uh, until either the economy slows or inflation slows significantly. And I, I think the inflation is slowing more than the Fed thinks. And a year ago, if I may say, uh, I was pretty agitated uh, that transitory was the wrong idea. Inflation was going up everywhere. Every place I looked, it was going up. And the Fed kept saying transitory, and they kept rates at zero. And now uh, I see inflation coming down in most places. Unfortunately, it's not coming down in the most visible places that the Fed looks at, like the Consumer Price Index uh, or the PCE. Uh, but uh, as a student of this, I, I see it coming down in so many places uh, underneath the surface uh, in the real world, if you will. And uh, so I think inflation is going to keep coming down. Yeah. And I think it could undershoot the Fed's target at 2%. Ed Hyman, thank you so much for this half hour. Generous of you to be with us. Edward Hyman is with Evercore ISI with a disinflationary call. That's the heart of it, Lisa. I mean, really. And, and he's done this before. And, uh, you know, with great respect, Ed's been lagged before. And maybe when some of his thoughts happen, maybe they happen a little later uh, than he thought they would work out. But the division here, the, the, the distance that Ed Hyman and other disinflationary optimists are from the street, I don't believe I've ever seen. It's, again, it goes to the confusion of the moment. What Ed Hyman was just talking about, there was fascinating, the technological advancements that could potentially bring down certain basic utility costs, right? So this would be a disinflationary force. You pair that with a deglobalization of sorts that people are talking about or a reglobalization and what that does if China isn't the, the factory to the world that it once was or doesn't provide the disinflationary force. How do you put this together into an equation? How do you go back to previous <clears throat> models and put in the right numbers and understand understand whether or not your model I, that, well, is even correct. Can you use previous models given a medical event? And that's where, and I go back, the heart of it, folks, for me is I've laughed, what, for 35 years at my grandmother with a scotch in her hand telling us about the pandemic of 1919. We thought she was nuts. But it's not just then the pandemic. It. But it's not just the pandemic, right? I mean, we saw an acceleration of work from home, of, you know, remote work, of what we're seeing with respect to a more nationalistic view. It's all of these different cross currents put together. My father <clears throat> is a mathematician, and he once said to me, you know, it's great when you have a nice model, but the models are always wrong. And if you take a look, your parameters are always wrong when you take yeah, a look at your models you. and yeah. understanding the moment that you're in. And he's right. We're kind of in the dark a little bit. I, I, yeah, I, I think we're hugely in the dark and it's going to be great, you know, through the economic data. We get a lot of economic data coming up the end of the week, which is honest. Thursday, tomorrow. Claim, do we get claims again tomorrow? We get claims so. tomorrow, but really the key one will be the PCE, core deflator, the key metric for inflation that the Fed looks at, which comes out on Friday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Yeah. Do you see that same upside surprise you know that you saw at? in PMIs and other uh, inflationary types of metrics? Mortgage rate 6.9 percent, as Ed Hyman mentioned there at the beginning of that conversation. I want to look at housing, and Michael McKee will have all of this for us. What an extraordinary morning. Futures up 8 the VIX shows the Yanks 23.10. Stay with us across radio and television. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning.